Hello friends. This is Muse Fanfection. How are you all? So in this video, we will see. What if Naruto had Eternal Mangekio Sharingan and Ultimate Wood release with 6 ancient bloodlines? But before we start, if you want more amazing stuff like this, then be sure to subscribe to our channel and like this video. Also if possible share this video with your friends. Now without wasting any more time. Let's begin the story. In a remote location one could only see destruction. As the sun was slowly rising it revealed the sight of two men. One barely standing over the other, with the one laying on the ground laying in a pool of his own blood, seemingly dead. All around the battlefield were weapons, craters, scorch marks, and a large waterfall that was undoubtedly created by the intensity of the recent fight. This place would later be known as the Valley of the End. The man that was barely standing had neck-length long black hair, black eyes, and was wearing worn red armor that was made up of overlapping metal plates going around the arms, chest, and shoulders for protection along with a large scroll attached to the base of his spine. This man was none other than Senju Hashirama, leader of the Senju clan and Shodem Hokage, first fire shadow, of Konohagakure no Sado, village hidden among the leaves. Why did it have to come to this, Madara? asked Hashirama to himself as he overlooked the corpse of his long-time friend. The now-identified man lying on the ground had long, spiky black hair that almost reached his hip while covering the left side of his face, including his pitch-black left eye. He was wearing the same style of armor as Hashirama over black robes. Lying on the ground with a katana impaled through his chest was Uchiha Madara, former leader of the Uchiha clan and the co-founder of Konoha. I'm sorry old friend but you chose the wrong path, goodbye, and may you find the peace in the afterlife that you couldn't find in this here my friend," said Hashirama before he turned to walk away from the long battle he had just fought, his head lowered due to the shame of not being able to save his childhood friend from his dark path and choices. Hash hash a couple of days later hash hash groan. Oh my head, where am I? Madara thought to himself as he slowly opened his eyes before shooting up, then wincing from the pain in his chest. Looking around, he found himself in a small wooden house. From the looks of it, the house was modest and small, with probably only a single person living in it. Easy there champ, you were wounded pretty badly when I found you. Said an unknown female as she approached him. Looking at her, he saw that she had smooth, long blonde hair that reached her waist, sapphire blue eyes and an oval shaped face. She was wearing a brown shirt that easily showed her d-cup and dark blue pants that emphasize her hips. All in all, Standing in front of him was a beautiful young woman that was smiling at him. Who are you? Where am I? Asked Madara a bit wearily to the female even though he was still weak from the battle. Well, my name is Namikaze Hanako and as to where you are, we are currently in my home in Kome no Kuni, land of rice, near the ocean. Explained Hanako featuring a small smile that didn't go unnoticed by Madara. What happened and how did I get here? questioned an impatient Madara as he tried to figure out what happened due to his memory being a bit fuzzy. So many questions. How about you lie down and relax? You are still recovering from your injuries from whatever fight you were in. You are very lucky that I found you and brought to my home, because even with my help in healing your wounds you still barely made it. In fact there were several instances that I was sure you wouldn't make it. After all there aren't many people who survive being run through the chest with a sword. Now, how about you tell me who you are? spoke Hanako, taking an account that this man is likely a shinobi. I am the great Uchiha Madara, former leader of the Uchiha clan and co-founder of Konohagakure no Sado of Hai no Kuni, the land of fire. Madara spoke with a great deal of pride in being a member of the Uchiha clan. A bit full of ourselves aren't we? giggled Hanako in response, this action earning a glare from Madara which only served to increase her giggles. So, are you a shinobi Madara-san? asked Hanako with caution, not knowing if he could be trusted. Indeed I am. I happen to be one of the most powerful shinobi in the world and am only matched in skill and power by Senju Hashirama, the Shodem Hokage of the Leaf. Said Madara, spitting the last word with a great deal of venom. He still despised the Leaf, along with his former clan for not following his leadership and abandoning him to follow a Senju, and Hashirama of all people. That last part really hurt his ego that his former clan would choose his former friend and longtime rival over himself. Though you still got you ass handed to you, 
said Hanako with a chuckle that turned into laughter as Madara gave her an irritated glare before turning away and murmuring something about troublesome blondes, in a way that was reminiscent of the males of a certain shadow using clan. Well, I'm going out to get some food. You should get some more rest cause it'll take a few more months till you're back to your full health. Said Hanako as she turned to leave. Seeing her go, Madara laid back down on the bed as he reminisced about his loss to Hashirama but gave a dark chuckle as he had gotten what he was after in the first place. Hash hash five years later Komei no Kuni hash hash many would think that Uchiha Madara was a cold person incapable of feeling love or care when it came to another person, however this couldn't be further from the truth. In the last five years a lot has changed and although Madara wouldn't admit it on pain of death, he has grown very close to Hanako to the point of treating her as a wife and even abandoning his plans for vengeance against his former clan members for their betrayal. Maybe this is the peace I have always chased. Madara thought to himself as he watched the love of his life who was currently laying next to him with her head on his chest. In the last five years he had adopted the life of a fisherman along with Hanako and had left behind all the battles and wars he once fought. Hanako had also gotten to know about Madara and his clan, the village he helped to create and even about his lifelong rival and former friend Hashirama. Madara had also explained about the life of Shinobi and the details about his Keke Jenke, Bloodline Limit, the Sharingan, Kapi Wheelai. In return, Hanako talked about her life and family, which led to the shocking revelation about her mother being a former member of the Kagaya clan whose members possessed the Shikatsumyuku, Dead Bone Pulse, Keke Jenke which allowed its user to manipulate their bones and use them as weapons. She explained that her mother had been banished because she didn't enjoy battle or bloodshed and had refused to participate in any violence. The clan had viewed her as a disgrace and so had cast her out. Eventually, she had met her father and had her. When Hanako was seven her mother died of sickness. Her father had been a fisherman who died at sea in a storm when she was fifteen. She had been alone ever since. Who would have thought that the great Uchiha Madara would live a simple civilian life away from battle? Ironic since I had always wished to die in the heat of battle at the hands of a powerful enemy. Madara thought to himself with a chuckle as he had almost died at the hands of Hashirama. If leaving the shinobi life is what it takes to be and to make Hanako happy, then I will gladly forget about my past and focus on the future. Thought Madara as he drifted off to sleep, all the while embracing the warmth of his lover. Hash hash six and a half years later Komei no Kuni hash hash six and a half years passed as we could now see a happy Madara leaning against a tree embracing his now official wife Hanako to his chest. Both were looking at the sea as they watched a four-year-old boy trying to stand on the water. The boy had spiky blonde hair, and sapphire blue eyes that had hints of darker blue in them. The boy's name was Namikaze Minato, son of Uchiha Madara and Namikaze Hanako. Seeing their son trying and failing to stand on the water caused both parents to sigh, feeling happy to have such a wonderful child and a wonderful partner that loved the other. Although Madara has abandoned the way of the shinobi, he decided to train his son and wife to defend themselves should the need arise. Madara had also explained to Minato why he was given his mother's name. The reason was because the Uchiha were known and feared all over the world and he didn't want to endanger Minato by giving him his name. This had led Madara to show his Sharingan and explain that one day he would also unlock both his and his mother's Keke Jenke and to be proud of his heritage. Hash hash three weeks later hash hash Madara was currently heading home after buying groceries from town. As he was nearing the house, he felt a burst of chakra coming from the direction of his home. Even though Madara had abandoned being a shinobi, he still kept up his training to keep his skills sharp in case he ever needed them. Dropping the groceries, he quickly sped through the woods towards his home. As the house came into view, Madara saw a bleeding Hanako holding a bone sword and Minato trying to hold off several aim shinobi while over a dozen more lay dead around them. Without hesitation, he disappeared in a burst of speed and reappeared just in time to stop a sword strike that would have killed his son. Activating his Sharingan, he glared at the four surviving shinobi in front of him. By their appearance and chakra levels, these shinobi were merely chunin level. Normally, Hanako would have been easily able to take out a few chunin, but over a dozen chunin was another problem entirely, especially when she was pregnant with their second son. The aim shinobi upon seeing the glowing Sharingan in all its power and glory caused them to tense up. W who are you? The leader stuttered after seeing Madara's eyes. After all, any shinobi worth their Hite 8, forehead protector, would recognize the signature Keke Jenke of the Uchihas and the power it grants them. 
I, I am Madara, Uchiha Madara. Madara answered as a gust of wind blew the hair going down his back to enhance his aura of intimidation and power that would cower all but the most powerful of enemies. Upon hearing his name, the aim shinobi paled and took a couple of involuntary steps back at seeing and learning the identity of the man in front of them. All knew of the legendary Uchiha Madara, former clan leader of the Uchihas, and a man whose power was only challenged by Senju Hashirama, the shinobi no kami, god of shinobi. Without hesitation, Madara activated his Suzanoo before destroying the aim shinobi without remorse. Looking back he saw that Minato had passed out from chakra exhaustion, before he quickly moved to the side of his fallen lover. He looked into her eyes, his heart filled with remorse for not being able to get here sooner, of not being able to have protected the love of his life and the person who mattered to him the most in this world. TT take care o of our SS son, said a weak Hanako, before giving one last to her husband. With a final, shuddering breath she closed her eyes, never to open them again as her soul passed on to the pure world. Madara just stood there frozen looking at his now dead wife as tears began to fall from his eyes. In his mind, he was getting flashes of the last eleven and a half years of his life. In the last few years, all he got in was happiness, only to now have it all stolen from him. Several hours later, Madara took one last look at his Hanako before he proceeded to bury her with a doton, earth release, jutsu, he made a decision that would influence the entire world. I was too naive to think this would last. Too naive to believe the world had changed too naive, to leave my plans behind. I swear, I shall lead the world to true peace and happiness. I will honor your memory, my beloved Hanako, and make a world made of love and happiness, and I will make sure that you will stand by my side." Madara thought to himself as he picked up his still unconscious son and jumped into the woods, leaving behind his former home and the fresh grave of his life. Hash hash one month later hi no kuni hash hash Madara and Minato were standing a few miles outside the main gates of Konoha. Madara looked at his son for what may very well be the last time before speaking. Minato, my son. Madara said, getting Minato's attention. In the last month, Madara had trained Minato into the ground, bent on getting his son as strong as possible so that he could keep himself safe. During this month of training Minato had activated his Sharingan which was quite a feat for someone so young. Remember, keep your Uchiha and Kagaya names and bloodlines a secret from the village, but never forget your legacy. Even though I dislike the Senju, this village will help keep you safe and strong. Never abandon your beliefs and fight for what you hold dear, only when fighting to protect someone precious to you will you show your true strength. I am sorry that I'm leaving you alone like this, but this is something I must do alone. Speak with the Sandame Hokage, Third Fire Shadow and tell him you are an orphan and wish to join Konoha, he will keep you safe. There may come a time that we will have to fight each other. Until such a time comes, farewell and good luck. And remember that your mother and I will always love you," said Madara before he started to walk away, leaving his son to walk a new path. Well, I guess this is it. Minato said to himself as he started to walk to Konoha's main gate. I swear I will make you proud too San and I will honor you memory Ka-san. Rest Kashina. You will have plenty of time to spend with your Sochi later," said Serutobi Bawako as she picked up Naruto and gave him to one of the nurses for his first bath before proceeding to check up on Kashina. Bawako is a woman standing at 170 centimeters, with long brown hair in a ponytail and brown eyes. She's around 50 years old and is the wife of Serutobi Hirazan, the Sandame Hokage and previous leader of Konoha. How are you feeling Kashina? Minato asked in concern from his place at Kashina's side. I'm just tired, she replied to her husband. That's good hun, he began to reply when an unknown voice suddenly interrupted him. Step away from the Jinchuriki Yandaimi. The voice came from a masked man who was holding Naruto hostage with the nurse who was attending to him on the floor dead. Okay, let's just calm down, said a frightened Minato as he and Bawako backed away from Kashina while turning to face the man. Concern was evident in their eyes for the safety of the infant Naruto. Speak for yourself Yandaimi, I am perfectly calm," spoke the masked man as he proceeded to throw Naruto in the air in preparation to stab him with a kanai. Suddenly in a yellow flash Minato appeared and grabbed Naruto before once more flashing away, this time over to Bawako who he proceeded to hand Naruto to. Buzzing was heard as Minato quickly realized five exploding tags had been placed on Naruto's blanket. In a burst of speed, Minato ripped off the blanket and threw it away before grabbing Bawako and Naruto and teleports them both to his safe house. 
Hash hash Monado's safe house outside Konoha hash hash an explosion ripped through the air in the distance as Monado appeared with Bawako and Naruto at his safe house. That was no ordinary shinobi. Said Monado out loud while wondering who the identity of the masked man was, this caused Bawako to agree. I don't know who he is, but he managed to not only infiltrate a highly secured and guarded area, but also was able to outmaneuver and separate you from Kashina. Bawako spoke as she checked over Naruto for any injuries. No ordinary shinobi is capable of such a feat. Teleporting the three of them to the Namikaze compound, Minato took his son from her arms and placed him on the bed before speaking. Don't worry Naruto, I'll be right back with your Ka-san. Giving a quick look to Bawako, he then teleported to Kashina's Hiraishin backquote, flying thunder god, backquote mark. Hash hash meanwhile undisclosed location outside Konoha hash hash. The masked man quickly approached Kashina, having warped them away from the explosion site. Placing his hand on her stomach, he proceeded to begin extracting the Kiyubi from its seal. It only took a couple of minutes before a figure is seen erupting from Kashina's stomach and materializes in the air. There stood the nine-tailed demon fox, Kiyubi no Yoko, in all its magnificent glory with its nine tails flowing through the air. With a single glance, the masked man trapped the disoriented Kiyubi under his control. The once red slitted eyes of the Kiyubi are replaced with a red eye with three black tomo circling a black pupil, the Sharingan glowing in all its power. W wait. Stuttered a weak Kashina as she realized what was about to happen. Incredible. The Uzumaki clan's longevity and life force is simply even the extraction of a biju, tailed beast, is enough to kill you, whereas with any other it would mean instant death. Said the masked man before commanding the Kiyubi to kill its former Jinchuriki. It's only fitting that the Kiyubi kill its former container. He spoke as the fox raised its hand in preparation to strike. Just as the Kiyubi is bringing its hand down, a yellow flash is seen. Standing in a tree not too far away is Minato with Kashina being held bridal style in his arms. He really lives up to his title as Konoha no Kiroi Senko, Hidden Leaf's yellow flash. The masked man says to himself as he warps away to the edge of the village. Meanwhile Minato flashes Kashina to the Namikaze compound and lays her next to their son, who she proceeds to embrace. Kashina, Bawako, I'm going to stop the Kiyubi. Bawako, look after them. He says before disappearing in a yellow flash. Hash hash north entrance of Konoha hash hash it was a warm, calm fall night in Konoha. Lights were seen all around the village as people went about their lives, completely unaware of what was about to happen. Backquote Kachiyose no Jutsu backquote, summoning technique, the masked man said, slamming his palm on the ground which released a large burst of smoke that quickly dissipated to reveal the Kiyubi, ready to unleash its wrath upon the unsuspecting village. With a sudden roar that echoed throughout the night, the Kiyubi began its rampage. With a swing of its tails and the use of its hand like paws nothing stood in its way as it caused pure destruction on the village. Sandame Sama the Kiyubi has appeared in the northern part of the village. Reported an Anbu agent as he bowed to Hirazan at the Serutobi compound. Yes, I've noticed. Summon the forces and evacuate the civilians to the bunkers. We must push the Kiyubi out of the village and stall until the Yandaimi can arrive. The Sandame ordered the Anbu agent. Meanwhile, Namikaze Minato is seen standing on top of the Hokage monument, ready to go face the Kiyubi when he senses a presence appear behind him. Immediately ducking as he spun around with a kanai. He watched as the kanai merely phased through the head of his enemy as if he was a ghost. Everything suddenly began to become distorted as the masked man began to absorb him into a ripple like pattern after grabbing onto Minato. Before the strange thing could finish, Minato flashes away to his safe house. Hash hash safe house after escaping from the masked man hash hash. That technique. Minato thought as he pondered what he had just experienced. It's a Jikukan. Space time. Ninjutsu more advanced than my own. It doesn't seem to require seals or I would have seen them with my Sharingan. It's best if I hide my Sharingan under a Genjutsu. Illusionary techniques. I don't know who he is, but his chakra signature seems familiar. Suddenly, a figure starts to appear from what looks like a vortex just a few meters away from Minato. Once the figure fully materialized, did Minato realize that it was the masked man? The two men stared at each other each one daring the other to make the first move. Who are you? Questioned Minato as he wondered who could possibly have the necessary power to unleash and control the Kiyubi, the most powerful of the Biju. Who am I? 
My name has long been forgotten and despised in the history of this village. I was once known as Uchiha Madara, but you may call me Toby. He replied with a chuckle at the irony of someone asking a masked man for his identity. Yeah, no I know for an absolute fact that you aren't Uchiha Madara. Although your chakra seems familiar, you are definitely not him. Minato responds while trying to figure out who the masked man's identity. The self-proclaimed Madara simply stood there, wondering how in the world the Yandaimi could know that he wasn't Madara. Something isn't right here, how could he possibly know Madara's chakra signature? Toby thought. Both warriors suddenly dashed at each other for battle at their top speeds. The fastest would be the victor. Minato throws his backquote Hiraishin backquote Kanai at Toby which phased through his head. Getting closer and preparing to face off, Minato charges a backquote Rasengan backquote, spiraling sphere, in his right hand in preparation of slamming it into Toby. Toby is about to touch Minato, preparing to absorb him, when Minato disappears from his sight only to reappear behind his back via the Kanai he had previously thrown. Twisting around Minato slams the backquote Rasengan backquote into Toby, vaporizing the area, while simultaneously marking him with a backquote Hiraishin backquote seal. I underestimated him. Toby thinks to himself when Minato appears in front of him, stabbing a kanai into him while applying a contract seal to free the Kiyubi from his control. Seeing that the battle has been lost, Toby says, I will be back Yandaimi, and I swear that I shall have my revenge against the leaf, before warping away. Something tells me that he wasn't joking, and then there's his chakra signature, he's definitely in Uchiha, and he seems to possess a chakra signature similar to my father's, though it felt muddled like something was interfering with it. Thought Minato as he gets ready to stop the Kiyubi. He then proceeded to teleport to the battlefield. Hash hash battlefield northern sector of Konoha hash hash on the battlefield stood the Sandame leading the Konoha Shinobi forces in an attempt to keep the Kiyubi occupied. Hiruzen was currently decked out in his battle armor and wielding his personal summon Enma, leader of the Saru, monkey, summoning clan, in the form of his trusty adamantine staff. Suddenly Hiruzen hears a shout of, backquote Kachiyose no Jutsu backquote, as Minato appeared above Kiyubi. In a puff of smoke an enormous toad appeared and landed on top of the fox. The toad was dressed like a Yakuza boss with a large sword strapped at the back of its waist. This was Gamabunta, leader of the Gama, toad, summoning clan and Minato's personal summon. Try and hold the fox down as long as you can. It'll take some preparation to teleport something this big. Minato shouts to the boss Toad over Kiyubi's roaring. Are you crazy? I'm not a miracle worker. Gamabunta cries out. Suddenly there is another poof of smoke and an enormous snake that surpassed both the Kiyubi and Gamabunta in size appeared and quickly proceeded to wrap itself around Kiyubi, further restraining the fox. Then how about SS some help? The great serpent hissed. The snake was purple in color with black rings running down intervals on its body. Massive fangs arranged similar to a constrictor, green eyes, and four horn-like protrusions on its head. This was Manda, the leader of the Habi, Snake, Summoning Clan and the personal summon of Orochimaru, a member of the Densetsu no Sanin, legendary three ninja. Manda, then that means, Minato said as a figure appeared next to him. The person was a man with long brown hair that reached his waist, pale white skin, and golden snake-like eyes with purple markings highlighting them. He was dressed in a light brown garb tied with a thick purple rope in a knot behind his back under which was a black polo and pants. On his ears were blue tomo-shaped earrings and around his neck was a white crystal inlaid with gold on a platinum chain, finally was a Konoha Hite eye proudly displayed on his forehead. I must say that this is quite upsetting. I leave on a mission for less than a week, only to return to Finn the village in ruins. The now identified Orochimaru said in an exasperated tone though one look at his eyes revealed he was teasing. Well, as much as I would like to answer I've just finished preparations and find stopping the fox to be more important than your bantering at the moment. Replied Minato with a smirk. Ah oh yes, an excellent point Minato. In that case you can proceed, we'll help secure the village to make sure there are no unexpected surprises waiting. Said Orochimaru as he jumped off Gamabunta's head and made his way over to the Sandame. With a smile at the snake Sanin's antics, Minato activated the technique causing both himself and Kiyubi to vanish. Hash hash the clearing near the safe house hash hash arriving near the safe house with the Kiyubi took a great toll on Minato, causing him to pant from the massive amount of chakra it took to teleport the Kiyubi so far. Yandaimi, you must hurry and seal me. 
I can still feel that blasted Uchiha trying to control me into attacking. I refuse to be controlled and used like a puppet, spoke the Kiyubi to Minato's surprise. He wants to be sealed. He thought in surprise as he teleported to the compound where he picked up Kashina, Naruto, and Bawako for the ritual. Kashina I need your help restraining Kiyubi for the ritual. The masked man is still trying to control it. He hurriedly spoke to his wife who proceeded to summon her Kongo Fusa, adamantine sealing chains, to bind the Kiyubi with the last of her chakra. Kiyubi was forced to the ground, its movements restricted. Minato began performing a long series of hand seals, finishing the chain with a call of, backquote Shiki Fujin backquote, dead demon consuming seal. Yandaimi, get out of the way. Kiyubi shouts as it feels one of its hands come free and be driven towards its next vessel in an attempt to kill him. Both Minato and Kashina jump in front of the attack to stop it without hesitation, causing them both to be impaled at the end of one of Kiyubi's claws. Yandaimi, Yandaimi, Kashina, Kashina. Both Kiyubi and Bawako cry out. Bawako immediately rushed to their side and began a futile attempt to heal them. Kashina cough w we don't h have much tt time. Any last w words? Minato asked as blood began to come past his lips. Naruto, she starts after giving a weak nod, I want you to grow up to be a good man and a strong shinobi. Be sure to make some friends, you don't need that many, only a few so long as they are your true friends who will always stick by your side. Also no drinking until you are at least 20 and be sure to stay away from Jiraiya. Finally be sure to find someone who you love and who loves you in return. I'm sorry Minato, I took up all your time. It's okay, you pretty much said everything I wanted to. He replied before turning to face Kiyubi. Kiyubi, can you do me a favor? I want you to look after my son for us. I know that he will most likely have a hard life and could use someone to watch out for him, he asks. It would be my honor Yandaimi. I promise I'll look after your kit and help make sure that he grows up to be an incredible person. The Kiyubi responds while wondering just how the hell this night could have gone so wrong. Thank you. Minato says before turning to speak with a crying Bawako. Bawako. Please tell Hiruzen that I'm leaving the village in his hands. Also tell all our friends that it was an honor to know such incredible and amazing people and that I'm counting on them to protect the village. Minato said with a sad smile on his face. Damn. Minato thought to himself, I need to make sure Naruto knows of my parents' legacy, but I can't let him go to the Uchihas with the Kiyubi sealed in him and I never told anyone about my heritage. Minato quickly started thinking before an idea hit him. That will work. This way I'll be able to inform him of his heritage and can train him in how to use his gifts from my side of the family. Quickly gathering the last of his chakra into his eyes, causing them to start spinning, he quietly calls out backquote Sukuyomi backquote, moon reader, while locking eyes with his son. Minato's breathing becomes even more ragged before saying, Naruto listen to what your mother tells you and remember that we'll always love you, in a weak tone before using the last of his strength to finish the ceiling. With a soft whisper of backquote hake no fu and shiki backquote, eight trigram ceiling style, Minato and Kashina passed on. Leaving behind a suddenly crying Naruto to be picked up by Bawako who proceeded to get their bodies ready for transporting back to the village so that they may be given proper burials. Alright I'm going to answer some things. First off, the girls I'm using are just the main girls. I am open to using other girls but these are the ones that are locked. Second. I encourage reviews because they help me know I'm doing a good job. However stuff like Darth Tenebris 2 is not only unwanted but will be ignored from now on. So if you have anything similar to say then you can shove it. Finally, this story is based off of legacy, there will be differences in this story and by no means am I trying to compare it to. I'm using the story because when I read it I came up with this idea. And there are plenty of others like me who base their stories off others. Alright some ideas I got from other stories are the mindscape training in this chapter from Naruto. Rise of Uchiha Senju Naruto, the idea of using Fuenjutsu to give the Bishosen powers to another weapon from the Mirage Blade Fox, and the idea to let Naruto recreate the Sandame Reikage's technique from the Yandaimi's legacy. I own none of these awesome stories but I do like their ideas. In every shinobi village, there is a reminder of their previous cage and the heroes to honor their memory and the sacrifice they did to protect and defend their homes. In Konoha, there are two such reminders. A memorial stone located near Training Ground 3 that has the name of all the shinobi who died in the line of duty, and the Hokage Rock, a large mountain in which the faces of each Hokage that have reigned carved into the rock looking out over the village. 
The Shodaim Hokage Senju Hashirama, the Shinobi no Kami. The Nadaim Hokage, Second Fire Shadow, Senju Tobarama, younger brother of Hashirama and Sen no Tekunaku no Sozo Sha, creator of a thousand techniques. The Sandame Hokage Serutobi Hiruzen, the Purofessa professor, as well as the longest reigning Hokage in history. Finally was the Yandaimi Hokage Namikaze Minato, Konoha no Kiroi Senko, and the hero of Konoha for stopping the Kyubi no Yoko. These were the cages of Konoha, both past and present, and are hailed as some of the most powerful shinobi in history. Each one was a legend and were hailed as the strongest Hokage of their time, and all but the Sandame had sacrificed their lives for the village. It has been five years since the Kiyubi incident and it is here that our story truly begins with a small boy that despite having been mistreated his whole life would rise up to become the greatest legend in history. Hash hash Konoha five years after Kyubi attack October 10th hash hash. It was a warm night in Konoha, the sun was just starting to go down bathing the village in a dimming light. The village's lights were turning on and one could see many people going about their business. Unlike many of the other villages, Konoha didn't seem very militaristic or cold despite Konoha being the most powerful hidden village. In fact many people if they saw Konoha would say that it wasn't a shinobi village despite its reputation. The day was October 10th and the village was covered in decorations, celebrating the defeat of the Kyubi that had attacked five years ago. Everyone seemed happy due to it being a time of peace, the war seemingly long forgotten, but not the hate and pain of the many that had lost their lives. There was one particular child who was very sad and lonely. Uzumaki Naruto was an orphan of the Kiyubi attack. He stood about 120 centimeters, 3 feet 11 inches, had long spiky blonde hair with dark red, near black, streaks that reached his shoulder blades, crystal blue eyes that had specks of a darker blue in them, and three whisker-like birthmarks on each cheek. He was wearing a white, short-sleeved t-shirt with an orange swirl on the back and black pants that reached his ankles. Despite being what appeared to be a normal child, Naruto was hated and despised by most of the villagers because he was a painful reminder of the Kiyubi attack. He had been expelled from the orphanage at the age of three and had lived on the streets for about a month until the Hokage's Anbu had found him and took him to the Sandame. The Sandame had eventually become a grandparent figure to him along with his wife. He had given Naruto a small apartment and allowance to live but he was constantly abused and beaten by the villagers. The village stores either kicked him out or sold him rotten or faulty merchandise for three times the regular price, which was something he had to also deal with in the orphanage. His apartment was consistently broken into and vandalized with the walls being covered in death threats and insults. He was forced to bathe in cold water and the heat and or power was constantly shut off. Because of the mistreatment, Naruto was forced to grow up and become highly intelligent along with resourcefulness to survive. To the point he could challenge most Naras in pure intellect. A side effect of this was that he had also become cold and calculative towards almost everyone but his precious people. Who consisted of the Hokage and his wife, Orochimaru of the Sanin, and the owners of a ramen stand called Ichiraku's Ramen. Only these five people cared for Naruto and wondered if he was eating enough or sleeping well. However it was during his birthdays that things became even worse. During his birthday the villagers and some shinobi would form a mob that would hunt him down like an animal with the intent to beat him to death. This is where we are now, hash hash with Naruto hash hash a scared Naruto was currently running through the streets of Konoha, trying his best to escape from the mob currently chasing him while the villagers and shinobi that it was composed of shouting. Die demon. Get him, we'll finish what Yandaimi sama started. We'll make you pay for killing our loved ones monster. All the while Naruto could only wonder what he had ever done to deserve this kind of treatment and harsh life. Stop, please. What did I ever do to any of you? Naruto yelled in question, running as fast as his small legs could take him though they were starting so give out from all the stress. Oh please, you know very well what you did demon. You killed both my brother and father, shouted one of the villagers as the others supported him with similar comments. Naruto kept running until he looked behind him to see his pursuers and noticed that a couple of them appeared to be Chunin. Even though Naruto was a stamina freak, no five-year-old could compete with a Chunin in terms of speed. One of the Chunin quickly closed the distance between himself and Naruto and once he was close enough he pulled out a kanai before proceeding to perform a horizontal slash. Naruto seeing that the kanai would most likely gravely injure, if not kill, him dived out of the way. As he was diving he noticed that everything appeared to be slowing down. 
After recovering from his dodge he unknowingly channeled Chakra to his legs, allowing his to jump over a fence to escape. The other shinobi seeing this were actually surprised, but decided they couldn't let the demon get away, so they all quickly drew out some kanai before throwing them at him while calling out backquote kanai cage bushin no jutsu backquote kanai shadow clone technique causing the already dozen kanai to multiply into about 30, all of which were heading at Naruto at high speed. Knowing that he couldn't dodge them all while in mid-air, Naruto started to observe and calculate the best way to dodge and or deflect them. It was then that it happened. Naruto's vision suddenly became much clearer while the kanai seemed to almost stop, allowing him to see where they would land just by looking. Following his instincts, Naruto channeled chakra to his hand which caused a kanai made of what seemed to be bone to grow from his palm. Raising the bone kanai he began deflecting almost every kanai with the exception of one that managed to slip past his guard and lodge itself into his shoulder. Giving out a cry of pain but managing to land on the other side of the fence to safety Naruto quickly began to run for several minutes before he managed to find a safe location where he promptly crashed. As his breathing began to slow, he raised his hand to the kanai lodged in his shoulder before pulling it out with gritted teeth. After the kanai was removed he noticed his wound was already rapidly closing, the bleeding slowing to a stop as it sealed shut. I wonder why I am the only person to heal this fast? He asked himself before beginning to walk through the back alleys of the village, being sure to stick to the shadows so as to avoid any more mobs. As he was walking he noticed that he was still holding the bone kanai and that his vision was different. His vision was black and white and he could see what appeared to be blue flames inside of people and that surrounded their bodies along with the faint outline of these strange lines running throughout their insides. He pushed his eyes to try and see better before suddenly passing out in the alleyway he was in the stress and exhaustion of being chased and receiving a kanai to the shoulder being too much for him. Hash hash Naruto's mindscape hash hash Naruto awoke to find himself in what seemed to be a sewer. There were pipes running along every wall and the floor was filled with water reaching the height of about 20 centimeters, 8 inches, he wandered through the endless maze of corridors while wondering where he was. Suddenly he heard what sounded like a soft male voice calling out to him. Follow my voice. It said. Naruto didn't know whoever or whatever was calling to him but he found himself drawn to the direction of the speaker. After walking for a couple of minutes, Naruto found himself staring at a gate composed of massive vertical bars. In the middle of the gate was a white paper tag with the kanji for, seal. He looked inside of the cage but it seemed to be empty. Hello there Naruto. The voice suddenly spoke right beside him, causing Naruto to jump back in surprise before noticing a man leaning outside the cage on the sewer wall. Naruto carefully observed the man, seeing that he was about 190 centimeters, 6 feet 2 inches, in height, had spiky blonde hair with two bangs framing his face, and sapphire blue eyes. He was wearing a full body blue suit with a standard Konoha Janin flak jacket. Over this was a white cape with red flames on the bottom and the kanji for, Yandaimi Hokage, on the back. Why Yandaimi H Hokage Sama? Naruto asked with a stutter. He knew very well what had happened five years ago and knew that the Yandaimi had died defeating the Kyubi. He was a hero, and not just any hero but Naruto's personal one. My name is Namikaze Minato and I was the Yandaimi Hokage, he said while looking at the small child in front of him and wondered how he could have appeared before him so soon. Naruto seemed at most five years old, so what could have caused the specifications needed for them to meet to have happened? How? You're supposed to be dead. Am I dead too? Naruto asked. No. No you aren't dead Naruto. Unfortunately, I on the other hand am most certainly dead. Minato replied calmly. But if you are dead, Naruto began, then where am I, and how do you know my name? He questioned while wondering what in the nine levels of hell was going on. Okay Naruto. I am going to explain everything to you so listen closely. Alright? He asked, to which Naruto nodded in reply. Currently, we are in your mind specifically your mindscape. The mindscape is basically a representation of your mind in a physical form, understand? Naruto nodded. Now, as to how I know your name it is quite simple, I know your name because I'm your father Naruto. Naruto froze when he heard that. No, it can't be. Gigi said he didn't know who my parents were, so how could he have not known that the Yandaimi was my father? Naruto thought to himself in shock. Why why you're my ff ather? How? He asked. Well as to how, you'll find out when you're older. Minato said with a chuckle. But it's the truth. 
I am your father and I can only say how sorry I am that I wasn't there for you growing up, but I had to stop the Kiyubi from destroying the village. He said with sorrow in his voice at not being there for his son. You've probably wondered as to why the village treats you as a monster, right? To which Naruto slowly nodded. Well, there isn't any easy way to say this, but five years ago when you were born and the Kiyubi attacked the village. The Sandame says that I killed the Kiyubi but that simply isn't possible. You see, the Kiyubi is a mass of chakra without a physical body so it can't die. The only way to stop the Kiyubi is to seal it away. But the only thing that can contain the Kiyubi is to seal it into a newborn baby due to the baby's chakra coils being undeveloped. So, unfortunately, the only way to save the village was to seal it inside you. Minato explained with a bit of shame while wondering how Naruto would react. What? What do you mean you sealed it into me? Does this mean that I am the Kiyubi? He asked, now realizing what all the names the village called him meant. No. No you aren't the Kiyubi, nor a monster, you are my son. What I meant by sealed is that the Kiyubi is trapped inside your gut, behind these bars. Kiyubi, you can come forward. Minato explained by speaking towards the bars. Suddenly, from behind the bars of the seemingly empty cage Naruto saw two glowing red eyes with vertical black slits for pupils appeared. As the eyes approached the bars, Naruto noticed the massive form of a fox with nine tails swinging wildly behind it. There, standing behind the gate was the most powerful being in the world, the most powerful of the nine biju, the Kiyubi no Yoko, the nine-tailed demon fox. Naruto seeing the massive entity jumped back scared to see the monster that had attacked the village and was responsible for so many deaths. There's no need to fear me kid. Kiyubi said as he watched the poor kid, he knew all too well what the villagers had done to him, and they called him a monster. Naruto. Minato said, getting Naruto's attention. This is Kiyubi and he's not the demon everyone thinks he is. The attack five years ago wasn't his fault. Minato began before explaining what happened on that fateful night. From the moment Naruto was born, to the masked man unleashing Kiyubi and controlling it into attacking the village and finally when Minato had sealed the Kiyubi inside Naruto. Naruto was still frozen, absorbing what had happened and everything that his two San, father, was saying. Naruto didn't know what to do or say, this was simply too much. Naruto. Minato continued, I'm so sorry that I had to seal the Kiyubi into you. You've had a harsh life until now, but I trust that with this things will be slightly better. Minato said before touching Naruto's stomach, effectively transferring the seal key to him and opening the cage. What are you doing? Naruto asked worriedly that his father had opened the cage and let Kiyubi out. Naruto, I told you that Kiyubi wasn't at fault that night. The Kiyubi will help you grow up, be at your side to help you in battle, and give you advice. The only thing I ask is that when you are close to death you release the Kiyubi. He doesn't deserve to be locked up and used as a weapon, said Minato. Will you really be my friend? Naruto asked, still a bit fearful of the fox but with a bit of hope in his voice. Of course, I will take care of you and help make you strong so that you can protect your home and friends. The Kiyubi replied. What happened next surprised both Minato and Kiyubi. Naruto suddenly left his two sand side and jumped onto Kiyubi's paw. So soft and warm, he said, getting chuckles from both Kiyubi and Minato. Now Naruto, there is more that I need to tell you. I don't know if you have realized it but doesn't your vision seem different? Minato asked. Yeah, it's actually all black and white, and I've noticed that people seem to have this blue flame inside them and they're surrounded by a blue aura. I can also faintly make out these strange blue lines that are running throughout their bodies. For instance, I can see the blue flames and lines in Yutu-san, while the Kiyubi is a solid red. Naruto replied. Good. Now Naruto, do you know who Uchiha Madara is? And what do you know of the Kagaya clan of Kirigakure, village hidden in the mist? Minato asked, getting a growl of disgust from the Kiyubi showing that it had no love for the former Uchiha clan leader. Yup. I know that he was one of Konoha's founders and a former leader of the Uchiha clan which is said to be one of the strongest clans in the world. As for the Kagaya, I haven't heard anything about them except they are supposed to be one of the strongest clans in Kiri, mist. Naruto said surprising Minato at what he knew about Madara and the Kagaya. Even though Naruto was five years old, he is very smart and liked to read. Unfortunately, he wasn't able to go to the library since every time he tried he was expelled by the librarian. You're correct about Madara, though I am surprised at the information you know about the Kagaya. Anyway, 
What you, or anybody, doesn't know is that Madara is my father and my mother was a descendant of the Kaguyas. I never said anything to anyone because I had decided to keep the knowledge a secret, he said. Naruto's eyes widened at the knowledge that the Uchiha Madara was his Oji san, grandfather, and that his Obi san, grandmother, was a Kagaya. I'm the son of the Yandaimi, grandson of the great Uchiha Madara, and I'm descended the Kaguyas. Giggle, there's no way I'm not becoming Hokage, Naruto thought. Ha! With you being my Tucson, Madara being my Oji san, and my Oba san being from the Kagaya, there's no way I'm not becoming Hokage, Databane. Naruto yelled while pumping his fist in the air and causing Minato to smile. I have no doubt you will, Naruto, Minato said before ruffling Naruto's hair. Now, you know that the Uchiha clan have a Keke Jenke, more specifically a Dujutsu, eye technique, right? Naruto nodded in answer. This Keke Jenke is called the Sharingan, which you have managed to unlock the first level of. Just look at the floor and you'll see it. Naruto proceeded to look down and observe his reflection. His eyes had turned from their normal crystal blue into blood red with a single black tomo in each eye. The Sharingan will continue to evolve until it's fully matured. This will be marked through the different levels. The most basic levels will be marked completed when your eyes gain three tomo each. After this is the fourth level, known as the Mangekyo Sharingan, Kaleidoscope Copy Wheel Eye, which will be marked by the tomo in your eyes fusing into a unique image. The final level, the Aen no Mangekyo Sharingan, Eternal Kaleidoscope Copy Wheel Eye, is marked by the appearance of a second image overlapping the original. Naruto was practically vibrating with excitement at the thought of increasing his Sharingan's power. His attention was once again brought to his two san when he cleared his throat. Now Naruto, let me tell you about what you inherited from your OBAA san. You see the Kagaya also possesses a Keke Jenke known as the Shikatsumyaku which allows its user to control their osteoblast, responsible for producing bones, their osteoclasts, cells responsible for breaking down bones, and the ability to regulate their bones calcium density. This allows the user to use their bones as weapons by growing new bones and making them in the shape of various tools and weapons, explained Minato. Shikatsumyaku users are exceptionally dangerous in taijutsu due to their ability to sprout their bones from virtually any part of their body, and the ability to form internal armor. He said to Naruto, whose eyes sparkled at the thought of using both the Shikatsumyaku and Sharingan together in combat. I am awesome databane, Naruto yelled in excitement. Yes, yes you are Naruto. Minato chuckled. Now for the next week in here, I will be training you to advance and control your Keke Jenke. I'll also be telling you important information regarding our family history, various techniques you can use, and a couple other things okay. Naruto nodded his head rapidly at the mention of training. Good, then let's begin, said Minato with a smirk. Hash hash time skip outside world several hours later hash hash. Naruto opened his eyes after training in his mindscape for a week with his two san, though only a few hours had passed in the real world. Getting up. Naruto absorbed the bone kanai back into himself and deactivated his Sharingan. Well Kiyubi, it looks like it's you and me now. Naruto thought to his friend. Indeed Kit. Though now you should go and tell the Hokage what happened, but be sure to keep him in the dark about the important parts for now. Kiyubi responded, getting a nod from Enruto in reply as he began making his way to the Hokage tower. Hash hash 15 minutes later Hokage Tower hash hash Naruto made his way into the Hokage's office after arguing with the secretary and threatening her to tell the Hokage that she had called him a demon. Apparently, the reason Naruto never found out about the Kiyubi is that the Hokage made a S rank law that prohibited anyone from telling him or the younger generation that he contained the Kiyubi in him and anyone who broke the law was subjected to immediate execution. GG. Naruto said, earning a smile from the old Hokage who was happy to see Naruto and get a break from the greatest enemy to all cage, paperwork. Naruto-kun. How are you? Do you need anything or are just here to see this old man? Sandame asked. Even though the Hokage wasn't actually related to Naruto he has quite close to him in the last couple of years to the point he treated him like a grandson. Something that his wife Bawako agreed wholeheartedly. I wanted to ask you if you could tell me who my parents are? Naruto asked messing with the Hokage a bit before he would tell him what happened. I wonder how he will react Snickers, he thought. I've already told you Naruto. I'm sorry but I don't know who your parents are. All I know is that they are heroes that died fighting the Kiyubi. The Hokage replied. 
he couldn't tell Naruto who his parents were, he was too young. All right, Gigi. Before I say what I came here for, can you tell your Anbu to leave? I only want you to know about this, said Naruto getting a surprised look from the Hokage. How do you know that there are Anbu in the room? He asked which Naruto replied he could sense them above the ceiling. Very well. The Hokage said and with a flick of his hand he signaled his four Anbu bodyguards to leave his room. Now Naruto, what do you want to tell me? He asked. Gigi, are you sure you sent all of them away? because I can still sense another person right there. Naruto said, pointing to the back of a bookcase. Immediately after saying that, the four Anbu quickly returned and dashed towards the intruder, quickly immobilizing them. The intruder had normal Anbu gear, black pants, and a steel chest plate on their chest for protection, but his mask was completely white with the kanji for, nay, root. Damn that Danzo, sticking his nose where he shouldn't. Thought Hiruzen. Naruto, you are indeed a skilled censor. You managed to capture an intruder that I and the Anbu were unaware of. Hiruzen complimented. Ha, huh, I knew I was awesome. Naruto replied, getting a chuckle from the old Hokage. After the room was empty Naruto approached the pictures of the previous Hokages and stopped in front of the Yandaimi. Turning to the Sandame he asked. Anything you want to tell me? The Hokage paled when Naruto asked him that. H how did you find out? The Sandame asked, wondering how Naruto found out who his father was. After all, very few people knew that Minato was his father. When I think about it, I could almost be his twin. Just take away the streaks in my hair, remove the whisker marks, and give me darker eyes and I'm basically his clone. It makes you wonder how nobody else has noticed. Naruto said before proceeding to explain what had happened, leaving out his Keke Jenke, being Madara's grandson and descended from the Kagaya, and that the Kiyubi would be helping him. Minato really was a genius, to think even in death he is capable of giving me a headache. Thought the Hokage. Now that you know, what are you going to do? You know that you can't tell anyone. The Hokage asked. I'm going to train to become strong like my father was and then I'm going to take that hat from you. Naruto answered, getting a chuckle from the old Hokage who replied. I have no doubt you will. One year has passed since Naruto discovered his father and heritage and training couldn't be going better thanks to Kiyubi's help. Now six years old, Naruto has been able to escape the villagers with the only exceptions being when trained shinobi are among them. Even at those times, even if he is caught he's able to fool them and escape. Kiyubi had Naruto primarily train in chakra control, since a benefit of having a biju sealed inside of a human is that it gave that person ungodly amounts of chakra and almost unending stamina. However, when you mix the Kiyubi with what may be called the Uzumaki Keke Genke you get trouble. It wasn't exactly a real Keke Genke but many people called it the tailless beast curse, members of the Uzumaki clan had unmatched amounts of exceptionally dense chakra with a regular chunin having chakra equaling that of a cage. Due to this, Naruto at 6 years old had enough chakra to match most janin. The downside of having so much chakra was that chakra control was extremely difficult. In the beginning, Naruto kept overloading any jutsu he tried with chakra causing it to either fail or blow up in his face. The first jutsu that he learned was the backquote henge no jutsu transformation technique backquote that allowed the user to change their appearance. Flashback one year ago, hey Gigi, can you teach me the backquote henge backquote? Naruto asked. Why do you want to learn it? Can't you wait for the academy to start? The Hokage asked to which Naruto replied, well, ever since I found out who my father was I have been wanting to train and grow stronger but to do so I need to enter the library and unfortunately they won't let me because they think I'm the Kiyubi. His answer caused the Sandame to lower his head in shame that he was unable to convince the villagers that Naruto wasn't a demon nor was he able to protect him. I'm sorry Naruto, I've tried my best to protect you. No worries, just teach me the backquote henge backquote. It will help me get into the library and not get thrown out of or overcharged at stores, said Naruto. Very well, it's very simple. The hand seals are inu, dog, inashishi, boar, ram. Then you release chakra to cover your body and think of the image you want. The Hokage explained. Naruto tried to perform the technique and transform into the Sandame, but the result looked like something from a cheap horror film. Go train now, I have work to do, the Hokage said. Okay, thank you, I'll catch you later, he replied. End flashback. With the backquote henge backquote at his side his life got significantly better. Although he hated to pretend to be somebody else, 
he managed to enter the library and get good food for normal prices. What surprised him was that the villagers were friendly and good people, the hate for the Kyubi simply having clouded their judgment. This caused Naruto to promise to himself that one day he would get their acknowledgement and if that wasn't possible then they would at least respect his power. He didn't want people to fear him but it would be better than being discarded as trash. Even though he wouldn't be able to access the shinobi section of the library since he was a civilian he still tried to gain access by backquote hanging backquote into one of the shinobi, which ended up working to his surprise. Since the librarian didn't have shinobi training she was unable to detect Naruto and so like clockwork he would scour the shinobi section of the library for what he wanted such as introduction to chakra control, basics of chakra, and several scrolls for the basic forms of the academy taijutsu. One of the best things he could have ever hoped for was his Sharingan. Thanks to the week-long training in his mindscape with his father, his Sharingan was fully matured with three tomo in each eye. Anytime he found a shinobi in one of the training grounds he would watch with his dojutsu to try and learn what he could. Thanks to his eyes being fully matured he was able to observe and copy several jutsu such as the backquote kawarimi no jutsu, substitution technique backquote. One night, Naruto decided to sneak through the village into the Namikaze compound. Biting his finger to draw blood, he pressed the bloody digit against the main gates to unlock it. There was a small poof of smoke before Naruto opened the gate and entered the compound. The compound was small, much smaller than the Hyugas or the Uchihas. At first he considered moving into the compound bit knowing he couldn't let anyone see him he discarded the idea in favor of waiting until he could reveal who he was. Looking around the compound, he found it had five bedrooms, three bathrooms, three living rooms, and a couple of storage rooms. However the biggest room was the library which contained numerous scrolls on taijutsu, ninjutsu, a few genjutsu, books written on fuinjutsu by his father and others, and dozens of Uzumaki clan kenjutsu were also many journals and diaries belonging to the Uzumaki and Kagaya clans. His father must have collected all he could about the Uzumaki and Kagaya which he stored here with his mother due to the both of his mother and father being the last of the Uzumaki and Kagaya respectively. Since the Namikaze were never a shinobi clan, only civilians, his father had hoped to start his clan along with the Uzumaki here in Konoha. Minato had never actually named his taijutsu style but it appeared to be a combination of the Hyuga's Juken, Uchiha's Sekundu, the way of the intercepting fist, and Mui Tai, the art of eight limbs. The style was designed to predict, avoid, and counter an opponent using punches, kicks, elbow and knee strikes on the pressure and weak points on the human body. One strike of the style can cripple, paralyze, and even kill an opponent. Naruto's training program was killer thanks to help from the Kiyubi guiding him. He started his training in the morning and worked all day long every day. Though one day Kiyubi had forbidden Naruto from constantly eating ramen and forced him to eat vegetables in a balanced diet. That was a very dark day for him indeed. Along with his training regimen, Naruto had taken to wearing weights to increase his speed and strength, but only a couple of pounds so it wouldn't stunt his growth. After all, he was only six years old though already at genin level. Unfortunately, he was still unable to produce a basic Bushin clone. The minimum amount of clones he could produce was 100, which wasn't very helpful when he only wanted one. On the bright side however, this would confuse the enemy to no end. He had also begun learning several weapon styles. Currently, he was furthest along with his Bojutsu, staff techniques, followed by Shurikenjutsu, Kenjutsu, and Tosenjutsu. Currently, Naruto was on level 2 of 5 in Bojutsu thanks to having asked the Sandame for some scrolls due to him being a master when it comes to the use of the bow. It also helped when he blackmailed him with the threat of telling his wife where he stashed his Icha Icha books. For his Kenjutsu, Naruto had gone to Orochimaru since he was skilled with a sword. This had caused an unforeseen event. Flashback Training Ground 44 Naruto was heading towards Training Ground 44, also known as the Forest of Death in search of the snake Sanin Orochimaru in hopes of getting some help with his kenjutsu. He had heard that Orochimaru had been frequently staying in the forest to train his apprentice Mitarashi Anko. Naruto soon arrived at the gate to the forest and began looking around for any sign of the Sanin and his apprentice. Taking in his surroundings, Naruto's instincts kicked in, causing him to roll out of the way of a kanai. Jumping to his feet he tensed at the feel of cool metal on his cheek and the appearance of a female body pressing itself against his back. Now what's this? A little gaki all on his lonesome at the entrance to one of Konoha's most premier and dangerous training grounds. 
A young female voice said. Once the girl backed off, Naruto turned around to get a look at his attacker. Standing there was a girl that looked around 12 years old standing at 4 feet 3 inches, she had purple hair tied back into a spiky ponytail that resembled a pineapple, brown pupilous eyes that glinted with mischief, and a mischievous smirk on her face. For clothing she wore a beige shirt and black anbu pants over a mesh bodysuit with the bottom of her pants taped close and a kanai pouch strapped to her upper thigh. Finally, around her neck was a Konoha Hite 8. My name, began Naruto, as Uzumaki Naruto and I'm looking for Orochimaru-sama for some advice on Kenjutsu. At this, the girl who he guessed was Anko raised an eyebrow at the idea that a kid who looked to be around six years old wanted training advice from Asanin. Right. You're what, six, seven years old Gaki? Why would you need training advice, much less advice from one of the Sanin, at your age? Anko asked skeptically. Simple, I want to get stronger, I need to get stronger, so that I can prove that I'm worthy of other people's respect and so that I can protect myself and those precious to me. Naruto explained with a serious voice and determination in his eyes. Asterisk kukuku asterisk, well that certainly sounds like a good reason to become stronger Naruto-kun. A voice suddenly spoke from seemingly nowhere. Looking around in shock, both Naruto and Anko watched as the hubby Sanin faded into view, a smirk on his face and his arms crossed in front of him. Orochimaru was currently wearing a black polo and ambu style pants with a kimono style jacket and grey ninja sandals. At his waist was a double edged gien with a bandage wrapped hilt, a guard with a snakeskin pattern, and where the blade met the guard was a purple magatama marking. The blade was in a black sheath that was connected by a purple rope belt. Orochimaru sensei, Anko exclaimed. How long have you been there? She said in disbelief that she hadn't sensed her sensei so close. My dear Anko chan, you still have a long way to go before you'll be able to sense me. And to answer your question, I have been here from the beginning of your little encounter. Orochimaru replied and gave Anko a look that promised they'd be talking about her little stunt later. This caused Anko to blush in embarrassment before giving a pout at the thought of the lecture she'd no doubt be receiving about attacking six year olds. Now then, Naruto kun, what exactly did you want to know? He asked the red headed blonde. After all, it wasn't every day that the six year old son of you too close, dead friends came looking for advice on how to wield a sword. Well, he began, I'm hoping you can give me some tips on how to start my training and what kind of sword you'd think would fit me. He finished. As Orochimaru began to hum in thought, Naruto found his eyes being subconsciously drawn to the Jien at the Sanin's waist. The six year old didn't know what it was, but something about the blade that seemed to call to him. Orochimaru, noticing Naruto's attention being drawn to his sword, raised an eyebrow in curiosity. Drawing his sword from his waist, he proceeded to raise it out to Naruto, until it was a little over a foot away. The entire time, Naruto's eyes never left the sword as he seemed to enter some kind of trance. Now really curious about the red-headed blonde's behavior, Orochimaru beckoned for Naruto to take hold of the hilt. Reaching his hand out, Naruto slowly took hold of the hilt. The moment his hand fully closed around the handle, both Orochimaru and Anko's eyes widened in surprise as the Jien rippled and morphed into a white snake that proceeded to wrap itself around his arm and sink into his skin leaving behind an intricate tattoo in the form of a eight-headed, eight-tailed serpent. Orochimaru and his apprentice stared at the tattoo in fascination before several puffs of smoke drew their attention. As the smoke dissipated, three entities were revealed. There before them were the Habi summon boss Manda, the Ryu summon boss Morikaze, and the Sanshuo, Salamander, summon boss Naitohanta. Morikaze was a western dragon with gold scales along with golden eyes with slit pupils, basically Smaug from the Hobbit when he was covered in gold. Naitohanta was a massive dark purple near black colored salamander that was as large as Gamabunta. Think the salamander that Hanzo stood on when he faced the Sanin. So, it has finally happened. Manda hissed, with the other two boss summons nodding in agreement. Looking confused, Orochimaru decided to ask the three boss summons what was going on. Pardon me, but would one of you mind explaining what exactly is going on here? Ask Orochimaru as he looked between the three bosses. It was Morikaze that answered. To put it simply Hubby Summoner, we are here due to the completion of a prophecy given by the original boss of our three clans, the Yamada no Orochi. This prophecy was given right before Yamada no Orochi disappeared, and said that the successor and future summoner of our clans would be determined by the Kusanagi no Tsurugi. 
This person would be able to summon from all three of our clans and would bring us to new, never before seen heights. He explained. Orochimaru and Anko were stunned by his explanation and proceeded to continue questioning the three bosses for several hours. Flashback over. When Naruto had finally come back to his senses, the three boss summons had left and Orochimaru had explained everything. Now Naruto was occasionally being taught by the Habi Sanin along with his summons everything he needed to know regarding how to utilize his new summons as well as how to use his new sword, the Kusanagi which had the ability to extend to great lengths, cut through nearly anything, be imbued with futon and raiden chakra, and was coated in a poison that changed with every swing of its blade. But what surpassed all of these developments was his tactical mind. It may be due to having a kitsune sealed in him that caused him to be extremely cunning and skillful with traps, which combined with the mind of a prankster guaranteed the next few years would be dark times for Konoha. One day Naruto was walking through the village, and because his backquote henge backquote wasn't up he received the usual glares and the occasional empty bottle thrown at him which he simply dodged. Naruto was going for his weekly ramen meal since Kiyubi only allowed him to eat it twice a week, which was better than not at all. Stupid fox and his accursed vegetables. He thought to himself. Ungrateful Gaki. If you only eat ramen then you'll end up being a midget. Your body needs proper vitamins and nutrients if you want to grow. Kiyubi said. In the last year the two of them had grown closer, or as a human and several hundred foot tall fox can. If you ignore the constant bickering and death threats, you'd be able to tell how much they liked and respected one another. Fine. I get it fur ball. Naruto replied as he continued walking to Ichirakus. He wasn't really paying attention to anything while walking until he heard a couple kids arguing about something. Feeling curious, he went towards the sound where he came upon the scene of three kids around 10 years old, most likely academy students, that were messing with a little girl. She looked around his age with neck length dark blue hair and the trademark white eyes of the Hyuga clan that had a hint of lavender. Deciding to help her, Naruto ran up to them. Hey, leave her alone. Naruto yelled in an attempt to get the bullies away from the girl. Oh, if it isn't a kid playing hero. Get lost before we hurt you too. What he assumed the leader said. This caused Naruto to jump in front of the girl to shield her as he pulled out his bow and adopted a defensive stance to show he meant business. The stance consisted of his left leg slightly ahead of his right, knees bent and both hands grasping the bow in a downward facing position. Seeing his stance caused the other two bullies to hesitate. He's just trying to scare us, the leader said, getting the other two to regain their courage. Let's teach him a lesson. He finished as the three rushed Naruto. One of the boys sent his right arm forward in an attempt to punch Naruto, who responded by using his bow to divert the boy's fist out of the way and then flipped his staff, striking the boy's chin in an uppercut. Another boy tried to hit Naruto from behind, to which he ducked out of the way before striking his leg causing him to stumble forward into Naruto's knee strike which made the bully fall to the ground in pain. Naruto turned to the last boy and the lead bully who froze in his tracks after seeing his friends being effortlessly defeated. Making up his mind, the bully picked up his two friends and ran away before he also got hurt. Seeing this, Naruto turned to the girl and asked, Are you okay? You aren't hurt are you? And no, I I'm fine. T then NKYU for H helping M me. The girl stuttered. Naruto wasn't sure if she was afraid of him at first, but after a moment guessed that she was just shy. No problem. I'm Uzumaki Naruto. What's your name? He asked after introducing himself. H Hyuga H Hanada, she replied while looking at her savior. Even though she was still young she couldn't help but blush and look down. Naruto may have only been six years old but he was quite a good looking boy. Come on, let me help you get up, he said, grabbing her hand and gently pulling her to her feet while noticing that she didn't have the Hyuga Soak no Juenjutsu, Hyuga main family's cursed seal technique, also more commonly known as the Kago no Tori Juen, caged bird curse seal. Remembering about hearing that the Hyuga heiress was his age, he realized that Hanada must be the heiress which meant that she was basically Konoha's little princess. Hey, I'm going to Ichirakus to get some lunch. Want to come? He asked, to which Hanada slowly nodded. Walking together, Hanada saw how the villagers were glaring at Naruto and wondered why. Their walk was otherwise calm, except for the glares, and quiet due to Hanada being too shy to talk with her savior. Soon enough, they arrived at the ramen stand where Naruto ordered two bowls of chicken ramen for the both of them. Oh, so is this your girlfriend then Naruto? 
A young girl behind the counter asked in a teasing tone of voice. Her name was Ichiraku Ayame, a 12-year-old girl with brown hair and eyes along with a pretty face. She was wearing simple clothes over which was a white apron. And no, nothing like that. We only met a couple of minutes ago. He replied with a blush. Though even if they had just met, he could see that she was actually very pretty and would without a doubt grow up to be a very beautiful woman. Hanada didn't say anything as she blushed brightly before turning away so no one could see her face. After Ayame was done teasing her surrogate little brother the two children talked a bit during their da, erm, meal. When they were finishing their food, a Hyuga member appeared and looked at Hanada. His name was Ko, a branch house member and Hanada's bodyguard. There you are Hanada-sama, your father is waiting for you, he said before taking her hand and started to lead her away. Be by Naruto-kun. I it was nice to meet Yu, she said, to which Naruto responded by giving her a foxy grin before turning back to finishing his meal. Looks like you've managed to get yourself a little vixen kit, Kiyubi said with a chuckle. She's not my girlfriend, Naruto angrily thought. You say that now, but we'll see in a couple of years, Kiyubi snickered. Arrow Kitsune, perverted fox, he thought. After he finished his meal and paid, Naruto left to continue his training for the day. Hash hashtag a few weeks later hash hash Naruto was walking back to his home after finishing his training and just like any other day, it left him sore all over. During the last few weeks he had increased his taijutsu and kenjutsu training and had started increasing his shuri kenjutsu difficulty. He could now hit a target with kanai and shuriken with deadly accuracy at 40 meters thanks to the aid of his sharingan. During his walk home he picked up two chakra signatures making their way through the woods, Feeling curious, he placed two fingers on the ground before focusing on their chakra. He quickly found one of the signatures to be his new friend Hanada that he met a few weeks ago. Wondering what she was doing out this late he went in search of her. When he arrived near her signature, he saw a shinobi with a Kumo Hite 8 on his forehead. Naruto recognized him instantly as Kumo's ambassador that had arrived to form an alliance between their two villages. Noticing that he was carrying a sack on his back that had Hanada's chakra signature emanating from it, he immediately realized that she was being kidnapped. Acting quickly, Naruto threw a couple of shurikens at the shinobi who promptly deflected with ease. Turning around to face his attacker, the Kumo Nin was surprised to see it was a little kid. Kid, you better run off now before I decide to kill you, I'm a Jonin, you're no match for me. The man said arrogantly. Naruto knew he was high genin level. But to beat a Jonin, he'd need to be cunning. He also knew that he needed to alert someone to give him some backup. Kit, switch with me. I'll send up a fireball into the sky to alert the Anbu. Naruto quickly agreed and switched with Kiyubi, who proceeded to go through hand seals before calling out back quote Katen. Gokaku no jutsu, fire release. Great fireball technique. Back quote and releasing a large gout of fire into the sky. The Kumo Shinobi was both surprised and impressed. A six-year-old shouldn't have the chakra necessary for a C-rank ninjutsu. Naruto, knowing he needed to stall for time, activated his sharingan behind a genjutsu covering his eyes and summoned his kusanagi. He didn't care if some of his secrets got out, all that mattered was keeping Hanada safe. The Kumo shinobi quickly engaged Naruto to kill him and get away before reinforcements arrived. Throwing a couple of shuriken. The Kumo Nin yelled out backquote shuriken cage bushin no jutsu backquote causing the shuriken to multiply into several dozen. Knowing he couldn't deflect them all, Naruto jumped to the left where the enemy was waiting and gave him a hard kick to the stomach and punch to the face, causing Naruto to fly back and collide with a tree. Thinking that the kid was done, the Kumo Nin walked forward to finish him off. When he was close enough, Naruto's head and arms shot up as he called out backquote senei jashu, Hidden shadow snake hands, backquote, which cause four large snakes to shoot out of each sleeve that proceeded to wrap up and bite the Kumo Nin, paralyzing him. With the enemy disabled, Naruto sealed away his sword before walking over to the sack that contained Hanada. As he was walking, he noticed that everything seemed sharper and clearer than usual, even with his Sharingan activated. Deciding to look into it later, he stopped channeling chakra to his eyes, causing the Sharingan to turn off and everything to go back to normal. Arriving at the sack that contained his friend, he opened the sack, releasing Hanada. Hanada looked up and saw that her savior was the blonde red-head kid she met a few weeks ago. Jumping forward, Hanada engulfed Naruto in a giant hug before bursting into tears. Shush it's okay. Everything will be okay. 
You're safe now, and I'm not gonna let anyone hurt you. Naruto whispered in a comforting tone as he rubbed her back. Hanada was still hugging him when reinforcements arrived led by Hayuga Hiyashi, Hayuga clan leader and Hanada's father. Seeing his daughter hugging the demon brat and the Kumo ambassador paralyzed while wrapped in snakes, he deduced that the brat was the one who saved his daughter, though that didn't stop him from yanking the demon out of his daughter's embrace. Stay away from her. Though I'm grateful for what you did, I'd prefer it if you kept your distance from her. Hiyashi said in a cold, hard tone. Grabbing Hinata's arm, Hiyashi began dragging her away while saying, You're still too soft and weak, which led to you almost getting kidnapped. You're proving yourself unworthy of being the heir of our clan and if you don't shape up then I'll replace you. As they left with Hanada being unable to say goodbye to Naruto. A few minutes later the Sandame arrived and ordered a report on the situation. After an Anbu finished his report and the Sandame noticing Naruto standing off to the side he ordered the Anbu to take the ambassador to Ibiki and Inochi in Anbu T and I before moving over to speak with Naruto. Naruto, are you alright? How are you feeling? asked Hiruzen in concern. From what he heard, Naruto had taken some hard hits and was in very real danger of dying. I'm alright. Only a couple of broken ribs and a bruised jaw but the furball will take care of it. I'm just happy I was able to stop him from making off with Hanada-chan. Though I'll probably increase my training regimen so I don't have to rely on luck next time. Naruto replied with a weak smile that the old Hokage caught. I understand, and don't worry. Now, tomorrow come and see me and I'll give you the payment for an A rank mission for this. The Sandame said as he ruffled Naruto's hair. Even though he was in great danger of dying, he still managed to incapacitate the enemy, save Hanada and receive credit for the completion of an A rank mission. In the last year, many things have happened around Konoha and even more so with our favorite blonde redhead. Now seven years old, Naruto had changed his outfit to dark green cargo pants with the ankles taped down a dark blue t-shirt with a light blue colored Celtic dragon design, and a dark orange jacket with only one sleeve. A few weeks ago there was an incident that shocked Konoha to its core. The Uchiha's clan prodigy Uchiha Itachi massacred over a third of his clan, leaving only his mother, younger sister and brother, along with most of the women, children, and elderly along with a few of the men who were out of the village alive. According to rumor, Itachi had used a genjutsu to torture his brother to the point where he had to stay at the hospital. This event, plus the mental torture, turned his brother into an avenger who only desired to kill his older brother for the murder of his father and clan members. Though the Uchiha that were killed were mostly arrogant pricks who thought they were better than everyone else, they were still members of Konoha and part of a highly respected and powerful clan. The resulting funeral service was huge, with almost every person in Konoha along with the remaining members of the Uchiha clan attending and paying their respects, with the Sandame and clan head Uchiha Makoto delivering an eulogy to the fallen Uchiha clan members. Naruto watched the service from afar with a sad face. Though he may not have known them and disliked their arrogant attitudes, they were still members of his family in a way and didn't deserve to die. He was also somewhat worried. Though he was young, he had learned early on in his life that not everything was as it seems, and this whole massacre affair smelled fishy. Thinking things over, Naruto decided that he would put aside his suspicions for the moment and inform the Sandame and Makoto about his legacy, but would still keep it a secret from the village as a whole. This would serve two parts. First, it would allow him some support in the form of a clan head, and second he would be able to have allies when he eventually revealed his heritage to the village. He also decided he would graduate from the academy at the soonest opportunity possible. When Naruto had first seen the academy curriculum and showed it to Kiyubi, they both wondered how Konoha was still the strongest village. The academy starts for kids at age 8 with the curriculum lasting 6 years. In recent years, the academy had been shifting to a more theoretical curriculum instead of a more balanced version. This meant that it was focusing more on history, math, and basic chakra theory instead of more practical arts like chakra control, taijutsu, shurikenjutsu, and jutsu practice. In fact from what he was able to find out, the written text for the graduation exam counted for over half the passing grade, with the ninjutsu portion taking up two-thirds of the final portion and even then the ninjutsu they needed to perform to pass were the most absolute basic and least chakra intensive possible. And speaking of graduating, the class he would graduate with, if he didn't do so early, would be filled with various clan heirs from almost every shinobi clan in Konoha. There was Inazuka Kiba, heir of the Inazuka clan who specialized in combination techniques with their ninkan, 
ninja dogs. Kiba was a loud, brash, arrogant boy with brown hair and eyes, and the iconic two red, fang-like marks on his cheeks, one on each cheek, representing his clan symbol. Sitting on his head was a small white puppy with slanted eyes and black, rectangular markings on his ears. This pup was Kiba's partner, Akamaru. Next was Akamichi Choji, the heir of the Akamichi clan. Choji was a round boy, like most of his clan, and wore a green shirt under a short sleeve haori, a white scarf wrapped around his neck, and black shorts with his hair sticking up from two openings in his bandana. Choji's clan specialized in converting calories into energy used for their unique jutsu that allowed them to increase the size of their body parts. The Akamichi were also the owners of several successful restaurants around Konoha. After the Akamichi was the Yamanaka and their heiress Ino, a blonde haired girl who kept said hair in a ponytail save for a single bang, light blue pupilless eyes, and wore a purple crop top and skirt combo over bandages. The Yamanaka clan specializes in mental techniques and have unique jutsu that allows them to enter and interact with a person's mind. From the Nara clan was Nara Shikamaru, a pineapple haired boy with black hair and a lazy expression on his face. Wearing a green vest over a gray shirt and dark blue pants, his entire posture spoke of absolute boredom. Like most Nara, he possessed increased intelligence and the ability to manipulate his shadow for a multitude of purposes. Unfortunately, like all male Nara he was also a lazy bum who preferred to sleep all the time. The Abarame clan was represented by their heir Shino who was mostly concealed by a large green trench coat and black sunglasses. All that was viewable was his spiky brown hair and the lower legs of his black pants. The Abarame were a reclusive, logical clan that housed special chakra draining insects that they used for their techniques. Second to last were the Uchiha, with their heiress Uchiha Yuko and her younger brother Sasuke. Yuko was a pale skinned girl with straight black hair reaching her shoulder blades and a blank expression on her face. She wore a white, long sleeved shirt with black sleeves, black anbu style pants taped at the ankles with gray wrappings, and heeled sandals. Sasuke was wearing a dark blue shirt with the Uchiha clan crest on the back and white shorts, a scowl on his face and his hair spiked up in the back, causing his head to resemble a duck's rump. Lastly was the Hyuga and their heiress Hanada. The Hyuga like the Uchiha were known for the dojutsu the Byakugan, white eyes, that allow them a near 360 degree vision, the ability to see the chakra network and the 361 tenketsu that run along it, the ability to see through objects, and finally the ability to see great distances. Combining this with their Jukan and they were easily one of if not the strongest clan in Konoha. Ever since he had saved her, Hanada had admired Naruto which soon began to develop into a crush that steadily grew as they hung out. The two of them were the best of friends and got together as often as they could, which resulted in Hanada's father Hiyashi slowly warming up to Naruto when he observed the positive effect he was having on his daughter. Unfortunately, this class also seemed to have a record-breaking number of the scourge known as fangirls, with the biggest one being a pink-haired banshee of a girl named Haruno Sakura, the daughter of civilian council member Haruno Akira. Personally, Naruto found it odd that the only civilian council member to do their job properly and who was a proud, respectable woman would have a daughter like Sakura. Thankfully, this year was going down without much trouble, with Naruto taking the rookie of the year spot with ease, something that drove Sasuke and Kiba nuts with their similar mentality of being either an alpha male, or Uchiha elite, as they referred to themselves, which in their minds automatically made them above everyone else. Naruto honestly found their attitudes both slightly amusing and highly irritating, especially when the two of them started insulting him and his friends. Honestly, at times he had to restrain himself from kicking both of their asses down a few pegs with the way they were acting. Thankfully his new friends in the form of Yuko, Shikamaru, Choji, and Shino were able to talk him down. Naruto often spent most of his time when he wasn't training alone or with Orochimaru, Anko, and his summons with his friends. They either trained together, went out to eat, and on that note Naruto, Hanada, and the guys discovered Yuko could eat such a large amount of food that when Choji informed the rest of the Akamichi they made her an honorary member of their clan, or just hanging out at one of their homes or the park. All things considered, this was shaping up to be a good year for him and by next year he should be able to graduate early. Hash hashtag one year later training ground 43 hash hash currently. Naruto was using his newly acquired jutsu to help him practice some doten and sweeten techniques along with a raten jutsu he acquired at almost the same time as his new technique. What was this jutsu he was using to help him train you may ask? 
why it was none other than the Nidam's cage bushin, shadow clone, and a rank kenjutsu, forbidden technique, that allowed the user to create solid copies of themselves that when dispelled would transfer their memories to the original. How Naruto acquired an a rank kenjutsu was really quite simple and honestly quite a stroke of luck. Flashback. Training Ground 7, three weeks ago. Naruto was currently working on an advanced form of the tree climbing exercise to increase his chakra control. The exercise consisted of walking up the tree while having leaves levitating and spinning in place above his fingers. Currently he was on four leaves and was taking a break before he started up again. Naruto would only consider this exercise mastered when he could stay on the tree for an hour with leaves on all ten fingers, both his knees, elbows, and his forehead. Just as he was getting ready to walk up the tree again, he stopped when he heard a strange sound coming from further in the forest. Being curious, Naruto began following the noise. As he got closer to the source of the sound he was able to identify the sound as what seemed to be countless birds chirping simultaneously. Finally arriving at a clearing, Naruto noticed that several of the trees appeared to have been pierced by an unknown object and in the center of the clearing was a silver-haired shinobi. The shinobi was rather tall and was dressed as a typical janin with a konoha flak jacket, ambu style pants taped at the ankle, and fingerless gloves with metal plates on the back. The man's silver hair stuck straight up in the air, with a face mask hiding everything below the eyes, and was wearing his hite aid at an angle so that it covered his left eye. The man was currently hunched over taking deep breaths as he rested. Feeling even more curious, Naruto activated his sharingan so he could observe in more detail. As the man straightened, he reached up and raised his hite 8 to reveal a fully matured Sharingan eye before he went through three hand seals and clutched his left wrist. Lightning started to form into an orb around his fist, the sound of birds chirping filling the air, before he charged at a tree while calling out, Chidori, thrusting his hand forward, his arm pierced the tree like a hot knife through butter. Pulling his arm from the tree, the man lowered his hite 8 so that it once again covered his eye, before nodding to himself. The silver-haired shinobi began walking from the clearing while pulling a small book from his kanai holster. Naruto slowly followed behind him with his chakra suppressed in the hopes of seeing some more techniques he could copy. Before long the man arrived at the village memorial stone, where he proceeded to just stand and do nothing while occasionally gazing at the monument. Disappointed that he wouldn't see anything else, Naruto prepared to turn off his sharingan and leave to continue his training when a loud voice was heard. Yosh. Kakashi my eternal rival I've come to challenge you to a most youthful contest, and if I lose I shall run 100 laps around Konoha on my head. The voice boomed. If not for his Sharingan Naruto might have missed the now identified Kakashi twitch at the voice. Suddenly appearing in a blur was no doubt the strangest man he has ever seen. Kiyubi who was currently watching this spectacle through his eyes could only nod with a shudder in agreement. Standing there in front of Kakashi was a man wearing a green spandex bodysuit over which was a Konoha Janin flak jacket, orange leg warmers, black hair in a bowl cut, and thick, fuzzy eyebrows that he would swear looked like caterpillars. Looking up from his book Kakashi said, Hum, you say something guy, in a bored tone of voice. The now known guy face planted before leaping up and shouting, Curse you Kakashi and your hip and cool attitude. As soon as Guy had fallen down Kakashi made a cross-shaped hand seal, causing a clone to appear in a poof of smoke before disappearing in a leaf. Shunshin. Guy not noticing the switch kept shouting while repeatedly saying youth and making more and more crazy self-imposed challenges. The clone of Kakashi just subtly sighed before walking off with Guy following him, all the while Guy kept yelling. Flashback over. Thanks to that event. Naruto was able to gain a powerful aid in the cage bushin for his training and learned how to perform the chidori, which he and Kiyubi could see massive potential for. Blinking at a sudden influx of memories from two of the clones he assigned to working on Doten and Sweeten Jutsu, Naruto looked over to confirm what he had just learned. And confirmed it was as their right where the clones had been was a freshly grown, medium-sized tree. Blinking in sheer shock at the situation, Naruto quickly made two new clones to repeat what just happened as he activated his Sharingan. Naruto watched in shock as the chakra from the two techniques the clones were performing, that was for what was supposed to be a collaboration technique, mixed before a tree rapidly grew from the ground and rose into the sky. Dispelling the clones, Naruto began to quickly make his way to the Hokage Tower where he would be meeting the Sandame and Uchiha clan head Makoto, knowing that he would now have more to tell them about than just his heritage and Keke Genke. 
Hash hashtag Hokage Tower. 20 minutes later hash hash arriving at the doors to the Hokage's office, Naruto knocked before waiting to be called in. After a few moments, Naruto heard the Sandame call out that he could come in. Entering the room Naruto saw Hiruzen sitting behind a large desk topped with stacks of paperwork. Standing next to the desk was the Sandame's wife Buwako, and sitting in one of the chairs in front of the desk was Uchiha Makoto. Ah, Naruto-kun, the old fire shadow greeted warmly. We were just talking about why you could have asked to meet us. Well Sandame Gigi, I have a few things that I need to talk to you guys about. So if you wouldn't mind, could you send out the Anbu in the room so we can speak in private? Naruto requested. Nodding his head with a curious look that was mirrored by the two women in the room, Hiruzen motioned for the Anbu to leave them. After waiting for a few moments to make sure they were alone Naruto performed several hand seals and called out, Fuenjutsu. Chinmoku no Ensui, sealing technique. Cone of silence. The Sandame, Bawako, and Makoto's eyes widened in surprise at seeing an eight-year-old perform a C-rank Fuenjutsu, especially considering how most people find Fuenjutsu to be too complicated an art. Impressive Naruto-kun. Only eight years old and already studying Fuenjutsu. You're just like your parents. Spoke Bawako with a kind smile on her face. The Sandame and Makoto nodded their heads in agreement with similar smiles on their faces, though Makoto hid her surprise at Naruto knowing who his parents were. Thanks Bawako Obaa Chan. Anyway, I've come to tell you the truth about what happened when I was six, specifically what I left out. Naruto began in a serious tone. Hearing his tone caused the three adults to straighten up in interest. Now, to begin with I need you guys to focus on my eyes and hand. Naruto said as he held up his left hand and closed his eyes. Channeling chakra to his eyes and hand, Naruto opened his eyes to reveal two fully mature Sharingan while a spike of bone grew from his palm before shaping itself into a dagger. Hiruzen, Bawako, and Makoto gasped in shock at the sight of Naruto's Sharingan and the bone dagger. Makoto's thoughts were racing as she tried to comprehend the sight of Naruto with the fully matured dojutsu of her clan, while Hiruzen and his wife were more composed but no less surprised. After several minutes, during which Naruto deactivated his eyes and absorbed the bone dagger back into his hand, was the silence broken. H. How? Makoto stuttered. How did you have those eyes? Hiruzen and Bawako were wondering the same thing. I'd like to know as well Naruto-kun, as well as how you have the Shikatsumyaku of the Kagaya clan, especially since to my knowledge you don't belong to either the Uchiha nor Kagaya clans. The Sandame spoke. Well, that's just it. Naruto began, I got both Keke Genke from my father. He said, causing all three adults' eyes to widen in surprise and disbelief at his words. How is that possible? Minato-kun never showed any signs of such abilities. Bawako said in shock, causing Hiruzen to nod in agreement. Indeed, not once in all the years that I've known him has he even hinted at having such abilities. The Sandame said as he thought back to all of his interactions with his successor. That's because he hid them due to who his parents were, specifically his father. Naruto explained. At their questioning stares he continued. You see, my grandfather was Uchiha Madara, Naruto explained. At that the Sandame fainted, Bawako froze in sheer disbelief, and Makoto went into shock. Looking at them Naruto couldn't help but sweat drop as he thought to himself. And they're supposed to be the leaders of a shinobi village. After several minutes, the adults in the room were revived and regained their composure, Naruto handed out tea that he made while he was waiting. Thank you for the tea Naruto, and we're sorry we were just surprised by the revelation of Minato-kun's father. Bawako began. But can you explain how this is even possible, because we were under the impression that Madara died at the Valley of the End? She asked, causing both her husband and Makoto to nod in agreement. Naruto nodded in acceptance before beginning to explain what his father had told him while they were training. He started with how Madara had survived his battle with Hashirama but had fallen unconscious from his injuries and chakra exhaustion. About how he had been saved by a woman who would years later become his lover and then wife. How his grandmother had explained her family history before they married and later on had a son and spent five years as a happy family before tragedy struck in the form of his grandmother Hanako being killed by Aim Shinobi. Madara's brief rage followed by tremendous grief at the death of his wife and unborn child before coming to the decision to continue his former plans, and finally the month he spent training Minato before leaving him at Konoha. After he was finished the adults took a few minutes to organize their thoughts and emotions. 
They couldn't help but feel sadness for Madara. He had finally found peace, love, and happiness only for it to be ripped away by the death of his wife and unborn child. Finally it was the Sandame who spoke. So, Madara had been still alive, and who would have thought Madara would have a child, though I guess Minato had to get his skills and talent from somewhere. The Hokage said, with the two women nodding in agreement. Agreed, still this would explain a few things, like how Minato-kun was able to fight at high speeds without getting tunnel vision. Makoto said with a thoughtful expression. Well Naruto-kun, we will guard this secret until you're ready to show everyone who you really are. And remember, you now have four legacies to continue. Your mother's Uzumaki clan, your father's, Madara's, and your grandmother's Kagaya clan legacy. Bawako said with a smile towards him with her husband and Makoto nodding in agreement. You don't need to worry. I don't plan on revealing anything until I'm strong enough to protect myself, my friends and family. Especially since both my father and grandfather had a real talent for pissing off Iwa and I neither want nor need problems right now. Naruto replied with a chuckle. That they did. The three adults thought as they remembered how Iwa had suffered at the hands of both Namikaze Minato and his now revealed father Uchiha Madara. Besides, when I reveal who I am they'll regret trying to hurt me or Antoni I care about as I burn their village to the ground before salting the earth so it'll become uninhabitable. Naruto said in a cold, serious tone that sent a slight shiver through the adults. I wouldn't put it past them Naruto-kun. The Sandame Suchikage, Ryotenba no Onoki. Onoki of both scales, is an old and stubborn fool, so you'll need to be careful. Said the Hokage. Makoto then decided to ask Naruto something that was bugging her. Naruto-kun, she began, catching Naruto's attention. I was wondering how it was possible for you to have a fully matured Sharingan especially since it's rare to even awaken it so early in life, she asked. Naruto smiled before answering. That is both simple, yet complicated. You see I awakened both my Sharingan and the Shikatsumyaku when I was five years old after some Chunin tried to attack me. After I escaped I fell unconscious and appeared in my mindscape. There I met my two San, father, who proceeded to explain everything to me before he began training me on how to properly use my Keke Jenke and advance my Sharingan. He explained before smirking. However, when that Kumo Nin tried to kidnap Hanada Chan, my Sharingan evolved into its Mangekyo form. Saying this, he activated his Sharingan before channeling more chakra into them, causing the Tomo to spin rapidly before fusing into a new pattern. Naruto's Mangekyo took the appearance of a red, six pointed star on a black background with a black, six pointed flower like shuriken design with six red dots on it, one for each blade, overlapping it. At the sight of Naruto's Mangekyo, Makoto fainted, Hiruzen keeled over in shock, and Bawako collapsed in disbelief. Naruto couldn't help himself and snickered at the sight before moving Bawako over to the office's couch and putting Makoto back into her chair. It wasn't until ten minutes later that the three adults began to stir from their various resting places. After another three minutes everyone was up and giving Naruto looks ranging from shock to serious and stern. The looks of shock were from the Sandame and Bawako with Makoto giving him a stern and serious expression. It was Makoto who broke the silence. Naruto, start talking. She began, her entire being completely serious. How do you have those eyes and you had better not have been using their powers? If you were taught about the Sharingan then you should know how dangerous those eyes are for the user. She finished. Bawako and Hiruzen looked at her in confusion before Hiruzen asked. Excuse me but how are those eyes dangerous to the user? I know of the Mangekyo's power from Tobarama sensei's stories, but I've never heard of anything that could be dangerous to the user. He questioned. It was Naruto who spoke. Gigi, he began, getting the Sandame's attention, she's talking about how the Mangekyo causes the user to go blind with repeated use of its abilities. Hiruzen's and Bawako's eyes widened in surprise as Naruto continued explaining. The Mangekyo is said to be the heavenly eyes that see the truth of creation without obstruction, but are cursed so that with every use the Mangekyo slowly loses its light, and descends into darkness. The only way to restore the user's light is to take the Mangekyo from a close relative, like a sibling, and transplant them into themselves. And the reason she asked how I got them is because the only known way to awaken the Mangekyo is for a person to feel overwhelming grief from witnessing the death of a loved one. Hiruzen and Bawako looked horrified at what gaining and using the Mangekyo entailed. Before they could sink further into their horror Naruto decided to ease their worries. However, thanks to my lineage, I don't have to worry about any of that. 
At this, not only the Sandame and Bawako, but Makoto as well looked confused before questioning him. What do you mean Naruto-kun? Bawako asked. What does your lineage have to do with anything? Hiruzen and Makoto nodded in agreement. Well, to explain that I'll have to tell you about a bit of history when it comes to not only the Uchiha, but the Senju and Uzumaki clans as well. Naruto began, causing the adults to pay attention in interest. You see, long ago the Rakuto Senen, Sage of Six Paths, was a shinobi of unparalleled power, to the point many considered him a god. During his life he had two sons, his eldest son, Indra, inherited a weaker version of his father's eyes that he called Sharingan and would go on to found the Uchiha clan. Meanwhile, the younger son, Asura, would inherit the sage's body and a less powerful version of his chakra and would found the Senju and Uzumaki clan. The adults were even more interested in the knowledge of the three clans' origins. Naruto continued. When the sage's life was ending, he had to choose which of his sons would continue his work and so called them to explain how they would go about it. Indra said he would use strength to bring the world to peace, while Asura said he would bring peace using love. After considering both of them and their paths to peace, the sage chose Asura as his successor. However, this didn't sit well with Indra who thought that as both the eldest and more talented son he deserved to be the one to lead the world to peace and as such he challenged his younger brother to a battle over who would gain the title of their father's successor. It was a long and grueling battle, but in the end Asura defeated Indra. Indra however, angry with this loss decided that he would take his revenge by exterminating Asura's descendants, i.e. the Senju clan, but knew he would need more power to do so. So he decided to perform a ritual using his blood that would transform ordinary people and give them the ability to use the Sharingan. He declared that he and the people he transformed would be known as Uchiha, and would stop at nothing to destroy his brother's legacy, that had taken the name of Senju. The three adults were now hanging on to Naruto's every word but were confused about what this had to do with the Mangekyo so Bawaku decided to ask. That's an amazing story Naruto-kun, but what does it have to do with anything? Both Hiruzen and Makoto nodded in agreement, so Naruto decided to explain. The reason it matters is because the Uchihas created by the blood ritual were not only less powerful, but there were also differences in their Sharingan. You see, the people turned into Uchiha, known as half-bloods, have different needs when it comes to activating and advancing their Sharingan with their eyes being much weaker than a direct descendant of Indra, even if their eyes are at the same level. It is incredibly rare for a half-blood to awaken their Sharingan early, and in some they never awaken them, and it takes much more effort to advance their eyes to more advanced levels. Also for a pure blood, a direct descendant of Indra, the Mangekyo is a natural part of the Sharingan's evolution and has access to more powers and abilities than a half-blood. The main difference between a half-blood and a pure blood is that a pure blood doesn't go blind from using the Mangekyo. Makoto's eyes widened at the implications. If this was true then it meant that Naruto and other pure bloods could use the eyes indefinitely. Naruto-kun, the Sandame said, gaining everyone's attention. What do you mean that a half-blood's eyes are weaker and that a pure blood has access to more powers and abilities? He asked curiously, with Makoto and Bawako also gaining curious expressions. Naruto smiled as he answered. What I mean is that a pure blood's perception is much stronger. Our eyes can see not only a person's chakra but their elemental affinities, along with the size and density of a person's chakra, and as our eyes advance we can begin to see the chakra network and tenketsu with increasing clarity to the point we can rival the Byakugan, and finally we can use our eyes to help us discover hidden messages and images in patterns and codes. The adults looked impressed at this as Naruto continued his explanation. As for us having access to more powers and abilities with the Mangekyo is due to a half-blood only able to use three of five techniques at a maximum when it comes to the Mangekyo. These five techniques available to half-bloods and pure bloods are the Black Flames of Amaterasu, Heavenly Illumination, a technique of the right eye that unleashes black flames that can burn for seven days and seven nights and are unable to be put out by normal means. Sukuyomi, Moon Reader a technique of the left eye and one of the most powerful genjutsu in existence that allows the user to warp the target's perception of time, space, and reality to a frightening degree. Koto Amatsukami, distinguished heavenly gods, a subtle yet powerful mind-controlling technique that allows the user to implant false experiences into the target's memory to make them think their actions and decisions are their own. Kamui, authority of the gods, a jikukan, space, time, ninjutsu that gives the user various techniques centered around their own pocket dimension. 
And finally Susanoo, he with the ability to help by all means, the ultimate offensive and defensive technique of the Mangekyo that can only be used when an Uchiha has awakened the Mangekyo in both eyes. The adults looked interested at this information with Makoto quickly connecting the dots as she exclaimed, Wait! Are you saying that a pure blood can not only perform all five of these techniques, but there are techniques exclusive to pure bloods? Naruto nodded in confirmation before saying, Yes, there are four techniques that are only available to pure blood Uchiha. Of those techniques, I only know of two of them due to being able to use them in addition to possessing Kamui and, due to having unlocked the Mangekyo in both eyes, Susanoo. And what would those techniques be Naruto-kun? asked Makoto. Naruto looked at her as he replied, Well the first technique would be Kagatsuchi, added tool Earthlord, a technique of the left eye that allows the user to have perfect control of any technique. Now this may not sound impressive at first, but it is a truly useful technique and when used correctly can be extremely powerful. You see by using Kagatsuchi the user will have complete control of the technique's shape, size, how it moves, where it goes, and what it does while maintaining the technique with no chakra wastage. This means that not only could you, for instance, create a hundred foot long fire dragon, but you could have the technique continue indefinitely with the only chakra used being for the initial technique, the Sandame, Bawako, and Makoto looked impressed as they thought about all the possibilities there are for such a technique before Makoto motioned for Naruto to continue. The other technique is called Kaminasosa, Divine Manipulation. Kaminasosa is a technique that allows the user to brand various things such as plants, weapons, people, tools, really anything with a unique seal formed from the user's chakra and telekinetically control whatever is branded that is in the user's field of vision. Naruto explained, causing the adults to nod at seeing how such a technique can be useful. Being able to control, manipulate anything in their field of vision would be extremely useful. Those are the two techniques that I know of. Naruto finished. The Sandiami took a moment to fully process the information before speaking. I see. Thank you for explaining everything to us Naruto-kun. He said, earning a small smile of acknowledgement while Makoto and Bawako nodded in agreement. You're welcome Gigi. However, there's one more thing we need to talk about before I go. Naruto stated, causing the three adults to become curious and even surprised at there being anything else they needed to talk about. Seeing their curious and slightly confused looks Naruto started to explain. You see, before I came here I was out at one of the training grounds working on some jutsu. During my training, one of the jutsu I was working on, that was supposed to be a Doden Sweden collaboration technique, something happened. I messed up the jutsu's combination and instead of the desired result, or even the technique just failing, the chakra of the jutsu merged and caused a tree to sprout out of the ground. He explained, shocking the three adults at what such an occurrence meant. It was Hiruzen's actions that drew the room's attention. The old man had put his hands to his temples and began muttering to himself about the past coming back to haunt him. Noticing their confused looks caused him to breathe a sigh before he began speaking. Yes. I know why, or more specifically where, Naruto-kun likely got the ability to use the Shodem Hokage's fabled Mokaton from. This information is a S-rank village secret that was created to protect Naruto-kun's mother Kashina from the less than savory elements of the village. He began. You see, it was back just after Hashirama-sama died that Senju Mito ne Uzumaki discovered that she was pregnant with her husband's second child. The time was somber and battle was constantly on the horizon due to the lull in the first shinobi war. The months slowly passed by as Mito-sama's pregnancy progressed and my sensei, the Naidame Hokage Senju Tobarama, worked to stabilize the village. When it came time for Mito-sama to give birth, she and the attending midwives along with my sensei moved to a secret location to prevent anyone from interfering. When the child, a boy, was born, he showed all the physical characteristics of an Uzumaki that being red hair, royal blue eyes, and general facial features one would find in most Uzumaki. During the months that followed, there was a, for lack of a better term, culling of the members of the Senju clan. Members of the Senju clan were being targeted and picked off during missions, and the clan was slowly dying. Fearing that her son may be targeted, Mito-sama with the help of my sensei and members of the Uzumaki clan, smuggled her child to Uzushirogakure no Sado, village hidden by the whirling tides, in Uzu no Kuni, land of whirlpools, where he would be raised by her father and later become leader of the Uzumaki clan and Uzushiro. While there he would eventually fall in love and marry another Uzumaki and have a daughter, 
Uzumaki Kashina, your mother. So you see, your mother was not only the heiress and eventual leader of a clan and nation, but was the granddaughter of Hashirama Sama himself. Hiruzen finished. Naruto and Makoto both looked on in awe of the revelation that Naruto was a direct descendant of the original Kami no Shinobi. Naruto was also surprised at the revelation that his mother, and now he himself, was the heir to an entire nation but wondered what happened to the rest of the Uzumaki clan and why his mother was even in Konoha. When he voiced these questions, the heir turned somber as the three adults gained sad expressions. It was Bawako that answered his question. I'm sorry Naruto-kun, but Uzushiro and most of the Uzumaki clan were destroyed shortly before the end of the Second Shinobi War. Its actions during both the current and previous war caused three of the five great shinobi, specifically Kiri, Kumo, and Iwa, to launch an all-out attack that caused its destruction and for the clan's survivors to scatter across the continent seeking refuge. Your mother at the time had been in Konoha for several weeks when we received word of the attack. My husband, who was the Hokage at the time, dispatched a force of over 300 shinobi to dispatch the remaining invaders and to look for any survivors. Sadly there weren't any besides a few dying members who were able to tell us what had happened. According to them before they succumbed to their wounds, the original invading force contained most of the three nations army, over 8,000 shinobi, was reduced to a mere 300 before Uzu was finally destroyed and the invader retreated. She explained to Naruto who was shocked at his clan being able to reduce the invading army to a mere fraction of their original size before finally falling. He was even more shocked when Bawako explained that the Uzumaki clan at the time consisted of just under 400 members and the fighting had gone on straight for five days and nights before everything was over. In his eyes, this made his clan all the more badass. Bawako got his attention back as she continued her explanation. That attack crippled the invading village's forces and is what ultimately allowed Konoha to win the war. With their armies all but decimated, Konoha was finally able to end the war and bring about a ceasefire with the other villages and it was all thanks to the Uzumaki clan. Because of this, Konoha honors the clan by wearing their clan symbol, a red spiral, on all Chunin and Janin vest. And it is that same symbol that was incorporated into our village's leaf symbol that is on every Konoha Hite 8. A sign of both our friendship with Uzu and the Uzumaki clan, and of our failure to help them as they helped us when we needed it most. Bawako finished in a somber tone. Hiruzen then decided to speak up. So you see Naruto-kun, not only are you a direct descendant of both Uchiha Madara and the Kagaya clan, but you are the direct descendant of Hashirama-sama and the last of one of the strongest and most loyal clans to ever exist, the Uzumakis of Uzushiro, said the Sandame. Yeah. And it looks like I'm going to have to do a lot more training than I thought if I'm going to live up to my legacies. Naruto stated. Well, that's everything I guess. I better get back to my training if I want to be ready. The three adults nodded in understanding before he took down his barrier and left, leaving the three adults to their thoughts about the future and what it could entail. Hash hashtag Konoha streets, five minutes later hash hash Naruto was walking through the streets heading back to the training grounds to continue his training. Thanks to his heritage and Kiyubi he knew that he likely had an affinity to fire from his Uchiha blood. And thanks to the discovery of his new Keke Jenke, he definitely had an affinity with water and earth since those elements were needed to form the Mokaton sub element. He knew it wasn't likely that he had any more affinities but decided that he should check just to be sure. Plus, with the discovery that he had Mokaton, he would have to set aside some time and clones to master it, which would be difficult without some scrolls on the subject or a teacher. All this in addition to training his Mangekyo techniques, school assignments, Taijutsu training physical exercising, training his chakra control, and more meant that he had a very busy schedule. Thank Kami he was able to use the cage bunshin no jutsu to aid him or else he may just go mad, which caused Kiyubi to give a snort of amusement at his thoughts. As Naruto continued walking peacefully in the shadows while thinking of all the work he needed to do, he suddenly heard the sound of somebody crying. Curious about who would be crying out here near the training grounds he decided to check and see who it was. So he followed the sound until he found who it was. Eventually finding the source, he was surprised to find Hanada with her knees to her chest, tears streaming down her face. Acting quickly, Naruto rushed to her side before asking. Hanada-chan what's wrong? Why are you crying? He said in a concerned tone. Hanada, upon seeing Naruto, quickly threw her arms around him in a hug as she began crying even harder. 
Naruto wrapped his arms around her in return before again asking her about why she was crying. When she didn't answer he decided that it could wait and began comforting her, whispering that everything would be alright and that he was there for her as he rubbed small circles on her back. Eventually the tears stopped as she fell asleep from emotional exhaustion. Seeing this, Naruto picked her up bridal style and took her to his apartment. Once there, he laid her on his bed before bringing over a chair so that he could sit by her side. Grabbing her hand, he patiently waited for her to wake up, eventually falling asleep around half an hour later. It was around 2 a.m., several hours later, when Hanada started to awaken. As she opened her eyes, she noticed that she was laying down on a bed in an unfamiliar room. Not knowing where she was, Hanada jumped up, waking Naruto from his position next to her. Upon seeing him next to her she couldn't help but blush until she remembered the events of yesterday. Seeing Hanada suddenly become depressed caused Naruto to look at her in concern before speaking. Hanada-chan what happened yesterday? If you need help then tell me. He said in a worried tone as he tried his best to understand what happened to make her so upset so that he could help her. Hanada looked to the ground in sadness before she decided to tell him everything. Reaching up, she began to remove the piece of cloth around her forehead to reveal a green tattoo. Recognizing it as the Hyuga clan's, Sok no Juenjutsu, main family's curse seal. The, Kago no Tori no Juen, caged bird curse seal. Naruto became shocked that the Hyuga would brand their heiress. T two days ago, M my F father left T to attend take C care of some BB business in T the CC capital. W with him G gone. The elders D decided T that I I it was T the P perfect T time to G get our rid of M me A as H heiress. A as they P P prepared to B brand M me. M my uncle H Hazashi found out and T tried to stop T them. In response. O one of T the elders activated his seal, C causing him T to C collapse F from T the PP pain. Here fresh tears began to pour from her eyes as Naruto pulled her into a hug to help comfort her as she continued. T the elder K kept T the AC sedative during M my aunt tire sealing and only S stopped when it was over. After I W was B branded T T they B banished me, C claiming T that T T they D didn't want M me T to S S sully T their clan any F further. Hanada finished. At this point Furious didn't even begin to describe how truly angry Naruto was. His teeth were gritting together as his Mangekio spun to life over how they could do something so cruel to her, their own family. To brand someone as young and kind as Hanada with a Juenjutsu is bad enough, to then banish her while claiming her a disgrace for no other than that they view her as weak was completely atrocious. It's okay Hanada, you're not weak or a disgrace. And you're not alone. You have me and I'm sure when the others and your father hear about this then you'll have them too. He said to her with a kind smile. But I'm weak, I was almost kidnapped. I was the same age as you and you managed to save me. I'm nothing more than a loser. She sobbed in reply, all her anger and frustration being infused within her words. No, Hanada-chan you are not weak, Naruto exclaimed. You are a kind, loyal, hardworking, and beautiful person. He said. Taking his hand to her chin and raising her head so they locked eyes as he continued, Look Hanada-chan, I'm hated by almost everyone in the village with only a small handful of people caring about my well-being. The people who hate me call me demon, hell spawn, and so many other horrible things while they do everything they possibly can to hurt me. To them I'm nothing more than a loser and monster that shouldn't even be allowed to live, but I refuse to give up and I'll never surrender to such people, that's my nindo and one day I'll prove them wrong about everything. He said with a determined expression, getting a smile from her before she frowned. And Naruto kun, is the reason you're treated so bad B because of the KKUB? She asked, knowing that it was likely a sore subject. Naruto's eyes widened in shock. H how? How do you know Ab about that? He stuttered at the sheer surprise that she knew. W well you see. When I use M my B by Akugan I can see T the Red Sea Chakra in your gut. In addition. The elders K kept telling M me to stay away from you and the V villagers are always calling you a D demon so I ID did a bit of our research. She stuttered out her explanation. Do do you hate me? Naruto asked worriedly, wondering if he was going to lose his best friend. No, no of course not, she yelled. Naruto was surprised by Hinata's yell, in all the time he's known her he hasn't ever heard her even raise her voice, let alone yell. Naruto-kun, I know that you're not the QB. You are a kind, cheerful, brave person who is willing to do almost anything for those he cares about. 
She explained while giving him a tight hug. This caused a tremendous weight to lift from his shoulders at the fact that Hanada wasn't rejecting him. Thank you Hanada-chan. Let's both work hard to prove to the Hyuga elders that banishing you was the worst decision they could have ever made. I'll be helping you every step of the way, he said with a smirk. Really? You'll help me? She asked hopefully. Of course, I'll always take care of the people I care about, whether by helping them train or simply offering them support. That goes especially true for you Hanada-chan. You're my best and most precious friend and I'll do whatever I can to make sure you stay happy. Naruto replied while giving her a smile full of such warmth and kindness that it caused Hanada to have a massive blush before fainting from happiness. Seeing Hanada blush caused Naruto to sweat drop before muttering to himself, damn, while her fainting from embarrassment like that is pretty cute, I'll need to help her work on that if I don't want that happening at an opportune moments. Tucking her into bed, a thought came to Naruto that caused him to smirk. Man. I can't wait to see what Hiyashi-sama is going to do to the elders when he comes back, he thought to himself. Leaving the room he went and laid on his couch knowing that the next few weeks will be not only busy, but entertaining. It has been three weeks since Hanada was banished from the Hyuga clan and a lot has happened since then. Two days after Naruto found her Hiyashi returned from his business in the capital and discovered what had taken place while he was gone. To say he was furious with the elders was an understatement. Hiyashi had gone on a complete rampage, beating the elders to within an inch of their lives before imprisoning them in the Hyuga clan dungeons where they would await execution for treason against the clan. It was also then that he and Hanada discovered some information that caused Hanada to burst into tears. It seemed that Hizashi had been rendered into a near vegetative state from prolonged use of the Hyuga Juenjutsu when he attempted to stop the former elders from branding his niece. The news of Hizashi's fate was taken hard by his immediate family. Hiyashi when he heard disappeared for a whole day into the Hyuga dungeons where the former elders' screams could be heard by anyone that passed by the compound. But the person who was hit the hardest by the news was Hizashi's son Neji. Neji, when he heard what happened to his father, immediately blamed Hanada and attempted to attack her in a rage. Luckily Naruto was nearby and managed to defeat him before he could hurt her, after which he dragged him back to the Hyuga compound and informed Hiyashi about what happened. Since then Neji has become a very arrogant and bitter person who is constantly demeaning others while harping about fate and how nobody could defy it. Needless to say people were getting annoyed by his behavior and fast. Since then Hanada had been living with him after meeting with Hiyashi and the Sandane to discuss what they should do. Initially, Naruto wanted Hiyashi to reinstate Hanada into the clan but Hiyashi explained that such an act would be a bad idea. While Hiyashi may have taken care of the former elders, there are still several members of the main family who agreed with them in their actions and may target Hanada to try and force Hiyashi into compliance with their desires. Another reason is that though Hanada may be his daughter and he never removed her as his heir, the fact that she was branded with the Kago no Tori no Juin meant that she would automatically be placed with the branch family and treated like a slave. When the Sandame asked why he didn't just remove her seal, Hiyashi revealed something truly surprising. It turns out that there is no known way to remove the Kago no Tori no Juin outside of a person's death, which is a major reason why he has been unable to abolish the seal. Without a way to remove the seal from those that are already branded, the main branch members who oppose him can threaten the use of the seal on the branch family and are able to use such threats to have their way, such as him being forced to be so harsh on Hanada during her training. Hanada was the most surprised at the revelation that her father hates the Hyuga Juenjutsu as much as she did and that the reason that he has been so hard on her is because he is between a rock and a hard place. On the one hand he wants to unite the two branches of the family and be a good father to his daughters, and on the other hand if he tries anything then there's a good chance that the Hyuga main branch members who oppose him will harm if not kill not only the side branch but those he loves as well, and with Hanada being branded with the seal that threat became even greater. It was this revelation that caused Hanada to embrace her father with tears in her eyes that her father does care for her and her sister, but is unable to publicly show it for fear of repercussions. After Hanada calmed down, the Sandame asked Hiyashi what he thought they could do. Hiyashi wasn't sure until Naruto gained an idea and asked why Hanada didn't move in with him. At their questioning looks he explained that by having Hanada move in with him he would be able to watch over and help her as well as the Hokage would be able to discreetly assign a guard to watch out for any funny business under the pretense of helping them settle in and teaching them the various things that they need to know when it comes to living together. Hell, if needed then they could have the guard act as a long-term caretaker until they both graduated from the academy. 
The two adults considered the idea and could tell that it had merit. By having the two live together they would be able to keep a better eye on and protect them. Hiyashi also knew that his daughter would be virtually safe from accidentally coming across those in the Hyuga clan who would wish her harm since none of the stuck-up clansmen would ever go so close to the red light district, never mind actually entering it. And the idea for a caretaker was also a good idea, though it would preferably be a female so she could help Hinata with any feminine issues she may have. A strong man who wants to protect his daughters Hiyashi may be, but even he dreads the day when he has to give his daughters, the talk. With Hinata's situation taken care of the two of them had gone back to his apartment to get their living arrangements settled. It was hour later that an Anbu member arrived and delivered all of Hinata's belongings along with a bed and dresser to add to the bedroom. It took them a little over 30 minutes for the two of them to get everything unsealed and put away, during which Naruto discovered that Hinata had a fondness for bunnies and a fascination with the moon. Now in the present, Naruto and Hinata were in a training ground working on their chakra control and elemental affinities. Naruto had taken out two pieces of paper and gave her one of them before explaining what Kiyubi had told him about how they were chakra paper and would show them their elemental affinities. Now Hina-chan, Kiyubi told me that to use these we just need to push some chakra into them and then their reactions will tell us our elemental affinities. For Sweden the paper will get soggy, Doton will cause it to crumble away into dust, Futon will split the paper in half, Katon will cause it to burst into flames, and Raiden will cause the paper to crumple. Now something else the Kiyubi explained is that the strength of the reaction will indicate the strength of your affinity. For instance if you have a weak affinity to fire then the paper will just start smoldering, while a strong fire affinity will cause the paper to produce actual flames, and the coloring of the flames will also be an indicator of the element's strength. He explained, causing Hanada to nod in understanding as she paid attention to his lecture. Holding up his own paper he began speaking again. Now, I'll go first and will be using my Sharingan to help me judge the chakra paper's reaction. Getting a smile from his companion, Naruto proceeded to channel his chakra and observed the paper's reaction. First, the upper right corner crumpled together into a tightly compressed ball that emitted a few sparks, then the upper right section of the paper burst into reddish-orange flames that burned the section to ash, finally the lower two section crumbled and grew soggy before seeming to fuse together and produce a small branch of wood. Seeing that the paper was finished Naruto let it drop to the ground before turning to an observing Hanada so he could explain. Now, to explain what happened, the way the paper crumpled together into a small ball and began emitting sparks indicates that I have a powerful lightning affinity for me primary affinity. After which I have a weaker affinity to fire that comes from my Uchiha blood. And finally I have an affinity to water and earth that makes up my Mokaton Keke Jenke. He explained. Now it's your turn Hina-chan. Just channel some chakra and I'll take care of the rest. Getting a nod, Hanada turned her attention to her own paper before channeling her chakra. The paper became soggy before crumpling together into a wet ball. Seeing the reactions Naruto decided to explain. Well Hina-chan, it looks like you have a strong water affinity followed by a secondary, average affinity for lightning. Hanada looked surprised and shocked at the information. Wondering what's wrong, Naruto decided to ask. What's wrong Hina-chan? I thought you'd be glad to know what your affinities were. Shaking her head, Hanada responded with a slight tremble in her voice. And no, I am glad to know, but I now know why I've always had so much trouble with the Jukin. At Naruto's confused expression she decided to explain. You see Naruto-kun, the Jukin is a doden based taijutsu style and I have an affinity for water and lightning, both of which oppose earth. That means that it is incredibly difficult, if not impossible, for me to perform the standard Jukin. Naruto had a look of understanding before gaining a questioning look. Wait, if you've had so much trouble with the Jukin then why hasn't anyone else thought of testing your affinities? Or you could have tried modifying the Jukin to work for you. At Naruto's words Hanada gained a look of sadness and irritation before she replied. While that may seem like an obvious solution to discovering and or fixing the problem, it wasn't allowed for a Hyuga to test their elemental affinities until they're either Genin or 14 years old. It was a tradition of my family and unfortunately many of my former clan members refused to do anything against tradition, even if the said tradition is outdated and or causing problems. She explained. At Hanada's words Naruto's face gained a blank look as he deadpanned, Hina-chan, no offense or anything but those members of the Hyuga clan sound like morons, causing her to blush in embarrassment and slight agreement. But what about changing the Jukin to suit you? 
Naruto reiterated his second question seeing as Hanada hadn't answered him. Here Hanada gained a look of irritation as she responded. Unfortunately, to do so I'd need access to the scrolls containing the Jukens Keita and there are only two copies of them. What's worse is that only the clan's head and elders can access them. Seeing Naruto's questioning look caused her to sigh before explaining. You see Naruto-kun the Juken Taijutsu style is taught to the current members of the clan by the previous generation. This is a tradition that was supposedly started to help the training and learning of the clan and its rules, laws, traditions, and various decorums by the younger generation of Hyuga. And because of this and the desire to protect clan secrets from being stolen there are only two master copies of the scrolls for both the Hyuga clan Taijutsu and the various clan Jutsu, and also a copy of the clan history, laws, and tradition. All of which are held in two secure locations. One in a reinforced vault in the Hyuga clan library, and the other is in the clan elders meeting room protected by various seals of which only the elders are keyed into. Frowning in confusion, Naruto decided to voice his thoughts on the matter. But if that's the case, then how is anybody supposed to have access to the information if they have any questions or research they need to perform? His question was answered by Hanada giving further clarification. Remember I said that there are only two master copies of the information. There are plenty of copies of everything but the clan jutsu in the library. The problem is that the only way to train in the clan arts is for someone to teach you. Otherwise you're pretty much out of luck if you want to train in anything new on your own. What's worse is that there may be other clan jutsu in the master copies besides the six techniques that we know of that the Hyuga clan use. She finished with a frown on her face. Naruto and the Kyubi, who had decided to listen in on their discussion, frowned as well but for different reasons. Naruto was frowning because to him the idea of forcing the younger Hyuga to have to go to the older generation if they wanted training seemed not only wrong but also foolish since doing such a thing easily limits the younger generation's potential to surpass the older generation. Kiyubi on the other hand was frowning for a different reason. It had been around for thousands of years and during that time had seen many different things, but through it all had noticed a pattern when it came to certain things. What Kiyubi was hearing now regarding the way that the Hyuga clan was being run sounded disturbingly like several other situations that led to the total destruction of several other clans and civilizations. It started with a person or a group of people getting into places of power, and then progressed to those said individuals weakening and controlling those below them by restricting, controlling, and even removing information from the public to help them keep their positions of power. Eventually, they would have weakened those around them to the point that they would be unable to defend themselves from outside forces, which led to those clans and civilizations either collapsing in on themselves to the point that they basically self-destructed, or they were invaded and destroyed, conquered by enemy forces. Of course there was the chance that it was wrong, but all the signs were there and the probabilities were quite high. And if Kiyubi was right, then there was a chance that not only was the kit's new friend in danger of those who will be willing to do anything to maintain their power, but so was the kit since those same forces won't be willing to leave any witnesses or evidence of their actions. So it would be best to warn the kit on the off chance that it was right. Hey, kit. Kiyubi said, gaining Naruto's attention. Kiyubi proceeded to give his warning and the reason for it, causing Naruto to frown in thought before deciding that there was one thing to do. In addition, this would allow them to take out three birds with one stone. Turning his attention back to Hanada, he explained his plan which caused her eyes to widen in shock before narrowing in compilation. Finally, she nodded in agreement and the two of them with Kiyubi's help began to plan. Hash hash later that night, outside the Uchiha compound hash hash. It was late at night and both Naruto and Hanada stood outside the Uchiha compound dressed in black and dark grey clothing with their respective dojutsu active, checking for any nearby patrols. Tonight, the two of them were planning on not only raiding the Uchiha clan compound for anything useful, such as jutsu, clan techniques, and any instructions and manuals for elemental transformation exercises, but the Hyuga and Senju compounds as well. The two of them had brought plenty of supplies to copy anything useful, and with the help of Naruto's Kamui they should be able to slip past any barriers and or obstacles that were in the way without alerting anyone. After making sure the coast was clear, the two infiltrators ran up to the wall where Naruto proceeded to shift his dojutsu to its mangekyo form before grabbing Hanada's hand and activating Kamui, allowing the both of them to walk through the wall and enter the compound. Heading towards the corner of the building by the street, the two stopped for a moment to ensure the coast was still clear before they stealthily moved over toward the main building that would house the clan's library and archives. 
They quickly reached the building and quietly slipped through the front door and headed down the hallway, checking the doors they passed to see if the library was behind one of them. It was three minutes later at the sixth door that they found their target. Quickly entering the library, Naruto quietly closed the door behind him before making three, cage bunchen, one to stand guard at the door in case someone came by, and the other two to help Hinata and the original to find and copy down anything useful. Looking around, Naruto and Hinata saw the library was divided into sections marked Ninja Arts, Clan History, and Records and Diaries. Ordering the two clones to check out the clan history and records and diaries and to make more clones if they needed help. Naruto and Hanada headed over to the section marked Ninja Arts and discovered that it was further divided into sections for each individual elements, along with a few sub-elements that the clan had encountered over the years, they may not be able to use the techniques but that didn't mean that the Uchiha clan weren't going to copy and analyze the techniques in case one of their future opponents used them against them. Irio Ninjutsu, Medical Ninja Techniques, Non-Elemental Jutsu, i.e. Taijutsu, Genjutsu, and such things like the Shunshin, and finally a very small section on elemental and chakra manipulation, that included several advanced chakra control exercises, and some information of Inten, Yin, spiritual release, and Yotan, Yang, physical release. Making several more clones to help, the two of them started going through a few scrolls before Hinata said, they're all blank. Getting a confused look from Naruto before he gained a look of realization. No Hina-chan, they're not. I can see the instructions just fine. I'm guessing that only someone with Uchiha blood can read these scrolls as an added security measure to keep the information from being stolen by any enemies. To anyone not of Uchiha blood, the scrolls will appear blank. It's really quite ingenious. Naruto explained, getting a look of realization from Hanada before she frowned. Don't worry, I'll read them aloud so you can help copy them so we can both learn them later. He said, getting a nod of agreement and a quiet, hi, right, from her before he turned back to work. Going through the scrolls, the two young shinobi in training gained several techniques from each section. Katen, fire release, Katen. Gokaku no jutsu, great fireball technique. The user gathers chakra before launching a massive fireball from their mouth at the target that burns on contact. It can also be released as a continuous flamethrower. See rank technique. Katen. Hosenka no jutsu, phoenix fire technique, sends a volley of small fireballs at the target that burn on contact. Number varies depending on the amount of chakra used. See rank technique. Kaden. Ryuka no jutsu, dragon fire technique. The user sends a compressed fireball in the shape of a dragon's head at the target. Even out of range, its power and reliability are stressed. See rank technique. Kaden. Goryuka no jutsu, great dragon fire technique, improved version of the Karyuden no jutsu. B rank technique. Kaden. Karyuden no Jutsu, Fire Dragon Bullet Technique, created by the Sandame Hokage. The user needs chakra then breathes fire from their mouth which are then manipulated into the shape of a dragon and then divided to strike the target from the left, right, and center reducing the target to ash with a focused strike. B Rank Technique. Kaden. Zukaku no Jutsu, Intelligent Hard Work, Cranium Carver Technique. The user fires a small fireball that erupts into a giant firestorm after making contact with a surface, causing widespread destruction to the area and is difficult to evade. B rank technique. Kaden. Heizeki Sho no Jutsu, Ash Pile Burning Technique. A technique where the user releases a cloud of gunpowder composed entirely of ash that stays in the air, surrounding the target and which can be used as a smokescreen. The user can ignite the cloud, burning the target in a violent explosion with a piece of flint placed on their teeth beforehand. Sweden. Water release. Mizu Bushin no Jutsu. Water clone technique. The user creates a clone made of water that possesses 10% of the original's strength. B rank technique. Mizu Shuriken Bunshin no Jutsu. Water Shuriken clone technique. The user creates and fires off water in the form of shurikens at the target. The numbers vary with the amount of chakra put into the technique. D rank technique. Mizu no Muchi no Jutsu, Water Whip Technique. The user creates one or more whips of water that can restrain or do damage to the target. C Rank Technique. Sweden Sui Shoha no Jutsu, Water Colliding Wave. The user creates a spiraling vortex of water that proceeds to explode from the top in the form of a wave and the direction the resulting wave goes can be controlled via hand movements. A Rank Technique. Sweden. 
Baku Suishoha no Jutsu, Great Exploding Water Colliding Wave Technique, an improved version of the Suishoha no Jutsu. S Rank Technique. Sweden. Daibakufu no Jutsu, Great Waterfall Technique. The user directs a large volume of water from a pre-existing source or expelled high into the air from the mouth. To manipulate so much water at once requires a great deal of chakra. Once high enough, it cascades down onto the targeted area, resembling a giant waterfall. A rank technique. Sweden. Swiriudan no Jutsu, Water Dragon Bullet Technique. The user manipulates water into the shape of a dragon, which they then direct at a target. The water crashes upon the target, dealing significant physical damage. B rank technique. Sweden. Suijin Heki no Jutsu, Water Formation Wall Technique. The user spits a stream of water from their mouth at the ground, which circles around them and rises upwards to create a clear wall. If the user is standing on a body of water, they can instead create the wall from their surroundings. The wall defends anyone within its perimeter from attack, with the wall's strength and how long the wall lasts is determined by the user and how much chakra is put into the technique. C rank technique. Sweden. Swiro no Jutsu, Water Prison Technique. The user traps the target in a sphere of water that can come from the user or their surroundings. The water that makes the sphere is noticeably heavy, which restricts the target's movement and breathing. The prison must be maintained either by the user themselves or a clone, preferably a water clone, by keeping their body in contact with the sphere. C rank technique. Sweden. Tepodama no jutsu, gunshot technique. The user creates water in their body using chakra. The user then spits the water from their mouth as fast paced, orb shaped projectiles whose destructive potential are determined by how much chakra is placed in them. C rank technique. Sweden. Sweden no jutsu, water bullet technique, a highly versatile Sweden technique with many variations. After kneading chakra in their stomach, the user expels a large quantity of water in the form of a powerful torrent aimed towards their intended target. C rank technique. Doton, Earth Release. Iwa Bunshin no Jutsu, Rock Clone Technique. The user expels earth from their mouth to form it into one or several identical clones. Unlike other clones, ones generated by this method do not disappear when struck with sufficient force, but rather break apart. C Rank Technique. Doden. Doryudan, Earth Dragon Bullet. After creating a mud source, the user creates a dragon like head to shoot mud balls at an opponent. B Rank Technique. Doden. Doryu Taiga. Earth Flow River. The user transforms the surface underneath their opponent into a muddy river that sweeps them off their feet and carries them downstream. C Rank Technique. Doden. Domu, Earth Spear. The user flows earth natured chakra through all or parts of their body, causing it to become noticeably darker, all while increasing their defensive power to become as hard as diamond. As such, this allows the user to easily be able to withstand most attacks with little to no damage, with the exception of lightning release ninjutsu. Furthermore, the destructive power of physical attacks is increased, making this a great all-purpose technique. B rank technique. Doden. Kangan no jutsu, fist rock technique. By encasing their arm in rock, the user can deal a powerful hardened punch against an opponent while being protected from direct contact with their target. If necessary, the weight of the rock can be increased to further increase the punch's destructive power. C rank technique. Doden. Mogorakir no jutsu, hiding like a mole technique. This technique changes the earth into fine sand by channeling chakra into it, allowing the user to dig through it like a mole. The user can pinpoint where they are and what is happening on the surface by sensing the magnetic forces, allowing them to use such information to launch a surprise attack on the enemy, or escape from detection by hiding deep underground. C rank technique. Doden. Dochu Aigyo no jutsu, underground projection fish technique. This technique allows the user to silently emerge from an earthen surface, moving as a fish does underwater. C rank technique. Doden. Shinju Zanshu no jutsu, double suicide decapitation technique. While lurking underground, the user grabs a target and drags them onto the earth, leaving only their head above the surface. D rank technique. Doden. Dochu Senko, subterranean voyage, a technique that transforms the earth surrounding the user into a fluid allowing them to close in on the enemy with high speed by swimming underground. Since being under the ground is a blind spot, the target has no warning, allowing the user to launch a surprise attack. By using this technique in conjunction with a weapon, it also gains a great effect as an assault ninjutsu, C rank technique. 
Doden. Yomi Numa. Swamp of the Underworld. The user creates a swamp by changing the ground beneath a target into mud, which the target sinks into. The mud is infused with chakra to make it sticky, ensnaring the target and preventing escape. The size and depth of the swamp are determined by the user's skill and the amount of chakra used and will ideally be made large enough for targets to become completely submerged. It is most effective when used against multiple and or particularly large targets. A rank technique. Doden. Doryuheki, earth style wall. The user creates a protective wall out of earth. The user can perform this technique by either converting chakra in their body into an earthen material that they spit from their mouth, or by using pre-existing earth. See rank technique. Futon. Wind release, futon. Sweyaku Kei's no jutsu, propelling winds technique, by letting loose a short blast of air from their hands, the user is able to fly in the opposite direction with considerable force. Can be used to either move very quickly to the side, or even propel the user 50 feet directly upwards. D rank technique. Futon. Daitopa, great breakthrough. After bringing their hands to their mouth, the user will blow a large blast of wind capable of leveling almost anything in its way. A variant of the technique involves a smaller blast of wind which gets ignited with flame. C rank technique. Futon. K shuriken, wind shuriken. The user envelopes their shuriken in a layer of wind chakra to increase their cutting power. B rank technique. Futon. Kazikiri no jutsu, wind cutter technique, using chakra or a ninja tool such as a war fan to manipulate or create an external source of wind, the user can create one to several blades of wind, which are capable of slicing through their target with ease. B rank technique. Futon. Shinkagyoku, vacuum sphere. The user takes a deep breath and exhales several small blasts of wind chakra that scatter in different directions, making it very difficult for one to avoid injury. Due to the properties of this technique, the expelled blast are capable of piercing into and potentially through an opponent's flesh. B rank technique. Futon. Shinkyujin, vacuum blade. The user exhales wind infused chakra onto a weapon in order to increase its sharpness, range, and lethality. For example, the user can infuse a kanai to resemble a makeshift scimitar or infuse shuriken to increase their range and cutting power. C rank technique. Futon. Atsugai, pressure damage. The user compresses a tornado-like mass of wind until it has a very high density before being released. The resulting blast can hit a vast range, inflicting massive damage on both the target and their close surroundings. B rank technique. Futon. Repusho, Gale Palm. A wind release technique where the user either increases their velocity, or by the user clasping their hands together, wind is compressed and transformed into a powerful gale, which has enough force to knock over a person. When used in conjunction with shuriken and kanai, the tools become more lethal as their speed is increased. C rank technique. Raiden lightning release. Raiden. Reiku lightning ball. The user creates spheres of electrical energy and launches them at the enemy. When they make contact with the enemy, the spheres electrocute them and throw them back. This technique can also be used in rapid succession or fire multiple balls at once. C rank technique. Raiden. Geon. False darkness, the user emits lightning in the shape of a spear from their mouth, which then pierces the enemy. Its destructive power is great enough to even pierce through rock, meaning it has a high killing potential. The user can increase the number of spears to attack multiple enemies. This, coupled with the sheer speed of the lightning, makes it a difficult technique to evade. This technique is capable of being focused into a straight beam, similar to a laser. B rank technique. Raiden. Jabashi. Electromagnetic murder, a basic lightning release technique that allows the user to create a wave of electricity from their hands. The user can vary its power from a small surge to shock an opponent to a powerful stream of lightning capable of ripping through solid rock. B rank technique. Raiden. Reigen Raikochu, lightning illusion flash of lightning pillar. A genjutsu where the user discharges electricity through their entire body in the form of an extremely bright light to disorient their target's vision. Once this is done, the user can implant images in their head, giving the user's allies the perfect opportunity to attack the unsuspecting victim while they are distracted. B rank technique. Raiden. Amigumo, spider web. After kneading chakra in the body and converting it to lightning, the user places their hand on the ground, releasing a surge of electricity around them in the form of a web, which electrocutes anyone caught in its vicinity. B rank technique. Raiden. Obadoribu, 
Overdrive, by utilizing lightning release, the user can speed up the signals that are sent from the brain to the muscles to increase the user's striking speed. The technique also gives the user cutting capabilities from barehanded attacks. See Rank Technique. Genjutsu, Illusionary Techniques, Kokuangyo no Jutsu, Bringer of Darkness Technique, the user places a hallucinatory darkness on a target's eyesight, causing them to see nothing but black. The technique requires large amounts of chakra to properly perform and is incredibly difficult to disrupt and dispel. A rank technique. Megan. Jigoku Goka no Jutsu, Demonic Illusion, Hell Fire Technique, a Genjutsu technique that causes its target to see a vision of fire. After the user forms the needed hand seals, a huge ball of fire will descend from the sky to envelope his target. The victims of the Genjutsu will believe they are being engulfed by a torrent of fire and flee their location for safety. B rank technique. Megan. Jubaku Satsu, Tree Binding Death. The target experiences the illusion of a tree coiling around them, preventing them from moving. Because the targets are immobile yet still conscious, this technique is a useful way to perform interrogations. Alternatively, users can simply kill the immobilized targets. B rank technique. Genjutsu. Sharingan, illusion technique. Copy wheel eye, by establishing eye contact with a target, the Sharingan user traps them within a genjutsu which can be exploited for one of various purposes, such as, causing instantaneous, but temporary, loss of consciousness or paralysis in the target, forceful extraction of information, relaying memories, removing genjutsu placed on the target by others, and controlling a target's actions. Megan. Kasugui no jutsu, shackling stakes technique. Firstly, this technique requires the use of the genjutsu. Sharingan. The opponent is caught in the illusionary world created by the user, and the victim is tormented with the sensation of having spikes driven through them, taking away their body's freedom. At the same time, the physical pain accompanying the illusion reveals that the greatest use this technique has is torture. See Rank Technique. Megan. Kyo Tenchi Ten, Mirror Heaven and Earth Change. When a genjutsu is used on them, the user quickly decrypts the genjutsu with their sharingan to understand how it works. They then perform an identical genjutsu on their attacker, causing a genjutsu reversal. The effectiveness of the reversed genjutsu relies on how strong this technique's user is relative to their attacker and whether or not the attacker has any keke jenke of their own. See Rank Technique. Megan. Kakoni Arazu no Jutsu, False Surroundings Technique. This technique layers an illusion over a location, causing it to look like a different location. Because of how wide an area the illusion can be placed over, that in turn makes it easy to trick others. Any who enter the area will be affected by the illusion and see the false location. But to create an illusion on such a large scale and to potentially deceive so many people raises the chances that the trick will be discovered by someone who is familiar with Genjutsu. See Rank Technique. Megan. Niju Kakoni Arazu no Jutsu, Double False Surroundings Technique. This technique places another illusion within another illusion created by the user. When the target dispels the first illusion, they will not realize that a second is in place. B rank technique. Kori Shinchu no Jutsu. Sly Mind Effect Technique. This technique causes a target or targets to, while walking in what they believe to be a straight direction, instead walk around in circles. C rank technique. Okay Hina Chan. We've got plenty of jutsu now and my clones have finished copying down anything that may be useful in the other sections. Naruto spoke as his clones came over to their location so he could seal everything into a master scroll. Okay, Naruto-kun. Now it's time to head to the Hyuga compound for their scrolls, and then we can finish the night with a stop by the Senju compound for the information we need from them on your Mokaton. Hanada replied with a small smile as Naruto finished packing everything away before the two of them stealthily made their way out of the Uchiha compound and headed for the Hyuga. As they snuck their way to their next target, Naruto remembered the conversation he had with Hanada a couple days after she moved in with him about her former clan, and the promise he made to help her achieve her dream. Flashback. Three days after Hanada started living with Naruto. Naruto and Hanada were currently eating breakfast together after they finished their morning workout when they started talking about what their hopes and dreams for the future were. So Hina-chan, what are your dreams for the future? Questioned Naruto after he got done explaining what his dream was. Hanada was still a bit shy around him and was currently blushing slightly when he had mentioned his desire to have a big family, but at least her stuttering and fainting around him was almost gone. Well, 
I know that I want to become a powerful Kunoichi to prove to everyone that I'm not weak. But. Even though I was banished from my former clan, I still wish to get rid of the Kago no Tori no Juin and unite the two branches of the family. I know that I may sound naive, but even though the elders branded me and threw me out and most of the other members of the main branch were cold to me. I still want the Hyuga clan to be united as one big happy family. And the branch family members were always kind to me, so by getting rid of the Hyuga Juinjutsu I'll be able to repay their kindness. She replied with confidence. She didn't know it yet, but Naruto's personality was starting to rub off on her. She was slowly becoming more confident in herself and had even started helping Naruto with his pranks. Especially against a certain duck butt, emo wannabe avenger and arrogant, dumbass, dog user. You are not naive Hina-chan. You are a kind-hearted person and I promise you that I'll remove your seal and then help you achieve your dream. He promised. After all, with the help of his cage bunshin, his father's notes on Fuinjutsu, and the help of a millennium-old fox demon that had been sealed within two Uzumaki seal masters, Naruto was progressing at a rather nice pace. Already he was a level 3 seal master, and that was 3 out of 15 levels after 7 months of training. End flashback. Naruto was broken from his thoughts as the Hyuga clan compound came into sight. Stopping a good distance away, the two of them scanned the compound from afar. Hanada once again using her Byakugan and Naruto using his unique sensing abilities. According to Kiyubi, his sensing ability was actually a combination of three different abilities, the Uzumaki clan's Kagura Shingen, Mind's Eye of the Kagura, a rare ability that allows the user sense chakra from exceptional distances in great detail. The negative emotion sensing ability that he gained from being Kiyubi's Jinchuriki which allowed him to sense negative emotions such as hatred and ki, killing intent. And finally the ability to sense the electrical current emitted by every living creature that he gained due to incredibly high affinity for lightning. These three abilities combined made Naruto the ultimate sensor, able to tell when someone is lying, sense any living creature whether they had chakra or not, and was able to locate, identify, and track anybody no matter how well they disguised themselves. It was thanks to Naruto's sensing abilities combined with Hanada's dojutsu that allowed them to locate and map out the guards patrolling the Hyuga compound. With the guards all located, Naruto and Hanada were able to sneak into the compound and make their way to the clan's library while avoiding detection. Once there, they proceeded in the same manner as the Uchiha compound with Naruto creating several clones to help them start copying everything useful. While the clones were doing that, Naruto moved over to the vault that held one of the two master copies of the clan's various scrolls. Having talked to Hanada about it, the two of them agreed to make a copy of both the master copies that the clan elders had locked away in case there is anything useful or important in them that the elders don't want anyone to know about. So, using his Kamui ability, Naruto easily slipped into the vault without tripping any of the security measures before bringing out a special seal he had managed to locate in his parents' house that was developed by the Uzumaki clan that allowed the user to make a complete copy of any scrolls. It was developed to make it easier to copy important documents and scrolls without having to manually do it by hand. Placing the Hyuga clan scroll on the seal, Naruto activated it. Now, Uzumaki Fuinjutsu, Shiruskuruyamini, Fuin, Uzumaki sealing technique. Seal Scroll Gemini. Seal. With a flash of chakra a duplicate scroll appeared next to the original. With a small smile to himself, Naruto quickly sealed away the duplicate scroll before returning the original to its resting place. Exiting the safe, he saw that his clones and Hanada had finished with the library and was waiting for him. Dispelling his clones after collecting and sealing away their findings into his master scroll, Naruto and Hanada slipped out of the library and began sneaking towards the meeting room for the clan elders. It took them 10 minutes to reach their destination, having to slip into several empty rooms to avoid a patrolling Hyuga clansman. When they reached the door to the room, Naruto took Hanada's hand and pulled them through the wall to get past the chakra lock that was on the door. Once inside, Naruto and Hanada scanned the room and eventually located the hidden safe. Quickly moving over to a blank expanse of wall, Naruto once again grabbed Hanada's hand so they could move into the vault without tripping any of the security seals. Once inside, the two of them were surprised that instead of containing a single scroll, there were over a dozen scrolls along with several documents in glass cases and at the center of the room was a case containing a scroll with a red swirl on it. Narrowing his eyes at the scroll, 
Naruto quickly made several clones to inspect and if necessary copy the various scrolls and documents around the room while he and Hanada headed to the center of the room. As they were looking at the scroll in the case, Hanada decided to ask Naruto something that was bugging her. Anyo. Naruto-kun. Do you have any idea what any of these documents are? And why does this scroll have your clan symbol on it? In a curious tone. Thinking it over for a moment, Naruto finally spoke. Well Hina-chan. If I were to take a guess then I would say that the clan elders are keeping more than just a copy of the clan's various scrolls and jutsu safe. It looks to me that they have been using this room to keep any evidence of their more secretive deals and probably even documents containing any blackmail they have locked away in a room that only they should have access to. I'd also bet that this room has clan items and probably weapons that they've secretly taken and kept to themselves so no one else can have and or use them causing Hinata to narrow her eyes before nodding in agreement as she looked around the room. In this room is probably evidence of everything the clan elders have done to take over and maintain their places of power in not only the clan, but most likely the Diamo's court as well. She could remember several cases over the years at different functions that her father took her to where the elders were able to make several political deals that benefited both the clan and especially them, that would have normally never happened. If Naruto was right then the reasons behind those deals was in this room, and gaining the evidence of them would go a long way of not only taking down those who would wish to rule over the Hyuga clan with an iron fist, but also the various people and nobles who were being extorted by them. What's more, if this room did contain artifacts and weapons of the clan that the elders have kept to themselves, then it would be a good idea for Hinata to take them for herself so she could learn to use them to help her free and unite her former clansmen. Hinata was broken from her voice by Naruto as he began speaking. As for why this scroll has my clan's symbol on it, if I were to guess then we're most likely looking at the source of the Kago no Tori no Juin and how the Hyuga clan got such an advanced piece of Fuinjutsu. Here Hinata's eyes widened in surprise before glaring at the scroll. At Hinata's expression, Naruto proceeded to remove the scroll from its resting place behind the glass, before opening and then reading it. Less than a minute later he began cursing under his breath as his hands trembled in anger. Getting a worried expression on her face, Hinata asked what was wrong. Taking a deep breath before releasing it, Naruto began to explain. It's worse than we realized Hina-chan. This is a letter that was sent to the Uzumaki clan that contains information and a copy of a very dangerous and illegal seal that was sent to my clan in the hopes that they would be able to create a counter seal. According to this, the Kago no Tori no Juin is in fact a bastardized version of a very advanced slave seal that was discovered and then outlawed almost a century and a half ago after it was used to enslave the royal family and nobles of a small kingdom in what is now Tetsu no Kuni, Land of Iron. That seal is one of the main reasons shinobi aren't normally welcomed into the country unless they get special permission to enter. It's also the reason Tetsu no Kuni's samurai don't like shinobi said Naruto as he remembered coming across the information of the event in the Uzu archives and then talking about it with Kiyubi who had heard about the event while he was wandering the country at the time. He was broken from his memories by Hanada asking what exactly the seal did. What it does is basically train the person it's placed on to willingly follow the commands of whoever has the master seal on them. It does this by introducing feelings of pain or pleasure to the person wearing the seal based on their thoughts and reactions to any commands given to them. Following the commands and thinking positive thoughts about their master will induce feelings of pleasure and happiness, while the reverse of such a thing will cause the person to feel pain. There are also sections here that influence the person's thought process to suppress thoughts of rebellion in a section where that allows the person wearing a master seal to punish the person via extreme pain to the brain by making a specific hand seal. He replied, causing Hanada to gain an expression of horror at what the complete seal is capable of. Naruto decided to help assuage her fears by giving her some good news. The good news is that it appears that the elders weren't able to replicate the full seal, and the parts that they did replicate weren't done properly either. At her curious look he explained. You see, they were only able to copy the parts of the seal that caused pain to the wearer via hand seal, the part that suppresses the thought of rebellion, and a few other parts that have to do with the seal removing all traces of itself at the death of the wearer. And those parts aren't at the level that they should be meaning that they won't function at peak performance, he said. What's more, he continued, I think I've figured out a way to argue its use in protecting the Byakugan from being stolen. You see, the parts that have to do with the seal disappearing with the death of the wearer were done in such a way that on the wearer's death, as the seal disappears it causes the chakra pathways in the body to basically burst open. 
This is what protects the Hyuga clan's dojutsu, because the chakra pathway's destruction also includes the ones that allows chakra to be channeled to the eyes, and the bursting of chakra will also damage the Byakugan due to the uncontrollable amount of chakra that enters them, thus rendering the eyes useless. Hanada took a few minutes to take all the information in before asking how that will help them argue its use in protecting the Byakugan from being stolen. With a smirk he replied. Because, it will only happen with the wearer's death. This means that all someone has to do is take the Byakugan from them while they're still alive and they'll have a fully functioning dojutsu. Hanada gained a look of shock since with this information, there was a huge gap in the Byakugan's so-called protection. This also means that there may be a chance that somebody else had found out and could have stolen the Hyuga's dojutsu, which means that there may be unaccounted for Byakugan out there. This meant the elder's entire claim about the seal being for the Hyuga clan's protection was a complete load of crap. Narrowing her eyes at this revelation, Hanada came to a decision. Turning around, Hanada began ordering the clone to start sealing away everything in the room. They weren't going to simply copy everything down. Instead they were stealing everything in the room without leaving behind anything as a message to the elders and their allies. This would cause them all to sweat since they would realize that someone out there knows all their dirty secrets. Getting nods of agreement, the clone proceeded as ordered and in less than a minute the room was completely bare. With that done, the clones dispelled themselves and Hanada and Naruto made their way out of the Hyuga compound and towards the Senju where they proceeded to copy anything to do with the Mokaton and any advanced chakra exercises. When they were finished, they headed back to Naruto's apartment and turned in for the night with their bounty safely stored in Naruto's Kamui dimension. It has been three days since Naruto and Hanada raided the Uchiha, Hyuga, and Senju clan libraries of anything that may be useful with helping the two of them in their training. Since then, the two of them have been going through everything and categorizing the scrolls by importance and relevance. To help maximize the time the two of them have, Naruto taught Hanada how to perform the cage bunshin so the two of them could send clones to the academy in their place after he applied a reinforcement seal to the two of them so that nobody accidentally dispelled them. With the issue of academy attendance taken care of, the two dove into their work. The information that took the longest for the two of them to sort through was what they got from the Hyuga elder's vault. Looking over the information, the two of them found dozens if not hundreds of inconsistencies between the master copy that was in the elder's vault and not only the second master copy from the library, but the entire library itself. In less than an hour the two of them found a multitude of laws and traditions that were added to the Hyuga library and its master copy that were nowhere in the copy that was in the elder's library, and this was not counting all the other laws and traditions that appeared to have been altered or removed from public access. One of the laws that they found that was added, and that they knew would upset if not infuriate Hanada's father, was one that said that if the clan head had more than one child, then the child who was not declared as heir was to be branded with the Kago no Tori no Juin and placed in the branch family. This apparently was not a tradition nor clan law and appears to have only been added just before Hiyashi and his twin brother were born. This meant that either the elders at the time, or even Hiyashi's own father, added this law for the express purpose of simply making one of them be put into the branch family. Why that was the case, they had no idea. However, the two of them were sure that when Hanada's father found out that there was no real reason for his twin brother to become nothing more than a glorified slave, he would likely flip his lid, especially with what had recently happened to Hazashi. Kiyubi, for one, was actually looking forward to Hiyashi's reaction and was hoping Naruto would be present to witness it since it was, in Kiyubi's own words, not every day you get to see a normally calm and composed individual go batshit crazy, to which Naruto couldn't help but agree. In terms of clan history, most of the parts that were removed or altered were done so to remove mentions of previous allies that were either dead or no longer allied with the clan. However, one of the parts that was removed that didn't relate directly to its history had to do with how the Hyuga clan gained its prestige and nobility. It turns out that about 230 years ago, a member of the main branch married a member of a noble family in what is now Kawa no Kuni, the land of rivers, that was wiped out about 30 years after the union. The family at the time were friends with the then rulers of Hai no Kuni, land of fire, Yuki no Kuni, land of snow, and Keis no Kuni, land of wind. It appears that the Hyuga clan were able to use that connection to gain prestige with various nobles to increase their standing. However what nobody knew, and what Naruto and then Hanada when he told her found funny, 
was that the Hyuga that married into the noble family had in fact run away from the Hyuga clan to avoid an arranged marriage that her father was trying to force her into with a member of the Hyuga clan council in order to increase his own standing within the clan. The Hyuga had fled and hid out in what is now Kawa no Kuni, where she eventually fell in love with the noble and married him. And then, when the Hyuga's father eventually found her and tried to force her to return to the clan with the backing of the clan council and elders of the time, her husband called forth his guardsmen and with the unanimous agreement of the other nobles banished the Hyuga clan from ever returning on pain of death and declared that they were enemies of his blood. When Hinata found out the origins of her clan's supposed nobility, she collapsed into uncontrollable giggles due to the fact that the nobility they were always bragging about was a complete sham and that they, in effect, drove away the only Hyuga that had a relation with noble blood due to their own stubborn pride. Naruto theorized that they probably lied to other nobles about their relation with the noble family and used it as an in with them while hiding the truth about their relationship. And if anyone does any checking of the facts then they would likely find out that a Hyuga did in fact marry into nobility, but that the exact relations would be unknown due to the passage of time and the destruction of the nobleman's line, likely along with any records they had, which meant that nobody would know the truth behind the facts. When Hinata was finally done giggling, she gave an evil smirk that impressed Kiyubi and asked what he thought the damage would be if they leaked this little fact to the public. Her question caused him to smirk and replied that they may just find out if the Hyuga tries anything. All the while Kiyubi was giggling about her being an evil little vixen and that the Hyuga better watch themselves around her if they didn't want to be on the receiving end of her wrath. Once they were done with the clan history section and filed away the various documents they moved on to clan techniques. And what a surprise that turned out to be. It turns out that they were right to raid the Hyuga Elder's vault since they not only got the scrolls for all the known stances for the Jukin, but several scrolls that contained advanced Kata that the Elders were apparently keeping for themselves. And that's not to mention the Jutsu that goes with the Jukin that weren't known about. Of the Jutsu that they discovered, the only known ones were Hakesho Katen, 8 Trigrams Palms Revolving Heaven, Hake Jiraku Sho, 8 Trigrams 16 Palms, Hake Sanjuni Sho, 8 trigrams 32 palms, Hake Roku Huian Sho, 8 trigrams 64 palms, Hake Kayaku Naijuhasho, 8 trigrams 128 palms, and Hake Kusho, 8 trigrams vacuum palm. Of the 16 jutsu found that are used in conjunction with the Jukin, only 6 of them were known to the rest of the Hyuga clan while the elders kept the rest for themselves. The new techniques that were found were Jukino Ichijin Kishin. Gentle Fist Art One Blow Body. A technique born from the Hyuga's innate ability to expel chakra from every tenketsu on their body. The user can use this jutsu to hit their opponent with a blast of chakra that will send them flying away from the user. The technique can also be used with pinpoint accuracy to target the weak point of a technique. Shote, Palm Bottom, an attack that consists of a quick, precise thrust of the user's palm to the opponent's body. The attack sends chakra into the area of the foe where struck to either stun them or, if a more sufficient amount of chakra is used, cause severe internal damage. Hake Chakura Hari, 8 Trigrams Chakra Needle. A technique where the user forms needles made from pure chakra that they use for long range jukin attacks. Hake Hasangeki, 8 Trigrams Mountain Crusher. A more powerful variation of Hake Kusho. The user hits the target at close range with a powerful wave of chakra emitted from their palm which sends them flying back, causing severe damage. Jukino Tenryu no Fureya, Gentle Fist Art Heavenly Dragon Flare. A technique where the user expels chakra from their arm in the shape of a dragon. The user will then, when striking an opponent, release the dragon that will carry away their opponent before slamming them into a surface and then exploding with the force of a medium strength exploding tag, dealing chakra burns. Hake Shugo Batoki, 8 Trigrams Guarding Buddha, a more advanced, mobile version of the Kaden. The user forms a one-directional shield of spinning chakra over their palm that they use to protect themselves while moving. The shield will dissipate or redirect any attacks that come into contact with it. Jukino Tengoku no Umo, Gentle Fist Art Heavenly Cutting Feathers. A technique where the user forms feather-shaped blades that make up the form of wings out of their chakra that increases their speed and gives them the ability to glide through the air and the user is able to use their feathers as a kanai substitute. The user can also use the technique to launch a barrage of feathers as a long-range attack. Hakesho Nagale no Kanran, 8 trigrams palms flowing disruption. The user injects their chakra into the target's muscles to act as an aesthetic that causes the muscles to relax and go limp. 
can be used for offensive or medical purposes. Hakesho Tayo Ferreya, 8 Trigrams Palms Solar Flare, a technique where the user gathers chakra into their palm and then releases it as a blinding flash of light and sound that blinds and disorients the target. Basically, it's a technique that acts as a flashbang grenade that is focused in whatever direction the user releases it. Jukano Kumori Kumo, Gentle Fist Art Misting Clouds. The user releases a large cloud made of chakra that acts to blind all but the user and disrupts chakra sensing abilities, allowing the user to sneak up on enemies without them being aware. From what the two of them could tell, most, if not all, of these techniques make use of the Hyuga clan's incredible chakra control along with shape manipulation to perform them. The techniques also appear to be designed to work with not only the Jukan but each other for a multitude of combinations. Hinata herself seemed especially interested in Tengoku no Umo, which caused Naruto to tease her that when she does learn it he will be able to call her his own personal angel. This of course caused Hinata to turn red and start stuttering before she fainted in embarrassment. It was 20 minutes later that she woke up and started pouting at him for teasing her. With the Jutsu scrolls done, they started working on the last of the information they got from the Hyuga clan. It wasn't until they got to the last scroll that they found anything really interesting. Opening it up, they found several storage seals with descriptions of what was in them. In one seal they found special armor that was for the clan head that consisted of a segmented do, cuirass, covered in scale mail with the symbol of the Hyuga clan engraved in the center and miniaturized seals engraved onto each individual scale. High date, quis, thigh guards, made from metal plates that were engraved with seals, suniate, greaves, shin guards, that were covered in seals that were designed into the shape of the Hyuga clan symbol, and Han coat, vambraces, gauntlets that cover the forearms, that were made from overlapping pieces of segmented leather that was covered in more scale mail and engraved in seals. The seals were for increased durability, camouflage, repair, maintenance, sizing, and comfort. The Han coat had additional seals on them to aid in the use of clan techniques, and increased protection, durability, and flexibility. Also that the wearer's hands and forearms had maximum protection. After the armor came a seal that contained weapons for the Hyuga clan head and air, s, that were designed to be used in conjunction with both the Byakugan and Jukan. The first weapon revealed was a longbow that was made of a light and flexible wood that was reinforced with chakra metal and seals, with the bowstring being made of braided chakra metal, and the grip covered in reinforced leather that had seals on it to provide extra comfort and grip when held. Patterned along the arms of the bow was the Hyuga clan symbol. After the bow came a pair of sai made from chakra metal. The sai were 52.705 cm, 20 and 3 quarters in, in total length with the widest point being 16.51 cm, 6 and a half in. The main blade was 33.02 cm, 13 in, long, 2.54 cm, 1 in, wide at the base that narrowed into a thin point at the end, and half a centimeter. 0.19685 in, thick with the base of the blade curving out and connecting to the side blades that were each 2.54 cm, 1 in, wide and 22.86 cm, 9 in. Finally the handles are 13.97 cm, 5.5 in, long and 2.54, 1 in, and wrapped in white leather. See profile for picture, image looks crappy but you'll at least have the basic shapes. The last seal on the scroll was instructions on how to use the armor and weapons along with some history about how they came to be. With all the weapons revealed Naruto at least now knew what to get Hanada so she can practice in public without alerting anyone that she was in possession of weapons that were supposed to be with the Hyuga clan. If any of the Hyuga clan discovered that she was in possession of their weapons, then it would be all too easy for the elders and their allies to realize that Hanada and himself were the ones who robbed them. Thus, it became imperative for Naruto to get her some normal weapons so she can learn how to use them efficiently without arousing suspicion. With the last of the Hyuga scrolls dealt with, all that was left were the Jutsu scrolls and documents on the Mokotan that they raided the Senju clan for. While only Naruto would be able to utilize the scrolls about the Mokotan, they had also managed to snag some advanced elemental manipulation exercises that were created by the Naidame Hokage, Senju Tobarama. They had found them after searching the Senju clan head's office to see if there was anything worth taking. The only other thing that they found that they thought may be of use was a scroll detailing the Reijin no Ken, Sword of the Thunder God, with information on how Tobarama made it and a manual on the secrets on how to use the thing. Naruto had taken the scroll due to hearing how the sword was stolen from Konoha, 
and man would Sandame Gigi get an earful from him about a priceless artifact of the Senju clan be taken, and believed that as one of the only two known people alive to carry Senju blood, it was his duty to one day find and recover the sword before bringing it back to its rightful resting place. Anyway, thanks to the scroll he discovered that while anyone can pick up the sword and use it, the person would only be able to use the sword's most basic abilities and that the blade of lightning that the sword creates, while still strong, is capable of being destroyed if one were to apply enough force. To unlock the full power of the rage and no ken, one must create a blood contract with it by drawing a very specific seal out of their own blood at the top of the sword where the blade forms. Naruto found this to be very useful information since without this info, the person who stole the blade would be unable to access its full power. This meant it would be much easier to recover the weapon without him having to worry about the thief using some of the powerful techniques and abilities that he read about. All in all, they had recovered plenty of info that would help them become strong shinobi. Now all they needed to do was work out a training schedule for what they'll learn and when. Hash hash three months later, training ground three hash hash it has now been four months since Hinata had moved in with him and the now nine-year-old Naruto could say with certainty that they had been some of the best months of his life. While Naruto had plenty of good times before with his friends from the academy, Sandame Gigi, Bawako Baon, Anko Chan, Orochimaru Sensei, and the Ichirakus, there were times that he still suffered from loneliness with the Kyubi being his only companion due to all of them being busy and having their own lives. With Sandame Gigi and Orochimaru Sensei, they were constantly busy with running the village and the R&D department respectively. Bawako Baon usually had more time available, but was also busy with maintaining the Serutobi clan and helping take care of her grandchild Konohamaru due to his parents being active shinobi. The Ichirakus were always nice people to him, but they had a business to run and couldn't always make time for him. Anko Chan was usually around more than others but unfortunately an incident occurred a year back where she was kidnapped while on a mission and was missing for over a month. She was eventually found, but unfortunately now suffered under the effects of a Juinjutsu that had been applied to her by a traitor to the village and now faced some stigma for it by some of the village. So now she was usually hard at work proving herself to be a loyal Kunoichi to the village and had recently joined Anbu. Finally his friends from the academy were great people but they also had clan matters and training to deal with so they weren't always free to hang out with. This was one of the reasons that he was training by himself so much. In addition to becoming stronger so he can accomplish his dreams. He also threw himself into training to help himself forget his loneliness. It was one of the reasons he had become so strong even though he was so young. Spending hours a day training with nobody else around but a millennium old fox in your head caused one to grow strong fast. And once he had gained the cage bunch and no jutsu, his training had skyrocketed. Due to being an Uzumaki he naturally had large and dense reserves of chakra at his disposal. Add to that that he was a Jinchuriki, and to the most powerful biju at that, and therefore having Kiyubi's chakra constantly flowing through his coils had caused his already large chakra reserves to expand on a near constant basis. According to Kiyubi, it was due to this that he now had as much chakra as the average cage level shinobi in terms of sheer size. And even then his chakra was much denser than most cage. If one were to take the amount of chakra he had and then factor how dense it was, Kiyubi explained that he actually had more chakra than any three cage level shinobi combined. This is what allowed Naruto to create hundreds of clones at a time. And since whatever the cage bunch and learn is transferred back to the original when they're dispelled, it allowed Naruto to complete months of training in a week if not mere days. Unfortunately, Having so much chakra meant Naruto had horrendous chakra control and was forced to delegate at least half of the clones he produced to chakra control exercises if he wanted to learn to properly regulate it. Another problem was that, Cage Bunshin only transferred chakra and muscle memory. So while using this method allowed Naruto to learn different jutsu, along with the kata of different fighting styles and weapons, it didn't help him with increasing his physical capabilities add to the fact that he was still too young to perform any rigorous exercises if he didn't want to hamper his growth meant that while he was becoming a monster when it came to most chakra based techniques, he was limited by what he could train with when it came to more advanced taijutsu and weapons. Which in many ways sucked since there were some advanced kata that he really wanted to try, including one for swords that allowed the user to cut through solid rock by increasing the blade's momentum through high speed movement. And what made the cage bunshin a kinjutsu wasn't just the sheer amount of chakra one needed to use it, but that the dispelling of too many at once could cause brain damage. 
The same thing happening if the clones that dispelled had been around doing different things for an extended period of time. It was because of this that the clones he delegated to learning and practicing jutsu and keita were forced to dispel one clone every 10 minutes after 30 minutes of training. So thanks to all the training he has done he has learned the basics of five different taijutsu styles, three kenjutsu styles, two bojutsu styles, and one to senjutsu style. Anyway, back to his original thoughts before he got sidetracked. Now that Hanada had moved in with him, he was no longer so lonely since there was now one of his precious people around him near constantly throughout the day and even some nights, due to Hanada sometimes crawling into his bed either because of a nightmare or because she was sleepwalking, and on that note the first few times it had happened it caused the two of them to not be able to look each other in the eye for a while since it turned out they were both cuddlers. With her constantly being around, he was able to have someone to talk to in his own age group about things like homework and training. It also helped that as time went on he was slowly developing a crush on her. However, he wasn't sure if he should act on these feelings due to it being March and he was planning on graduating this year from the academy in a mere two months. Though it helped talking to the caretaker that Sandame Gigi assigned to stop by and watch over us while helping take care of any problems they may develop several weeks ago. The woman, an Inazuka named Hannah who turned out to be the elder sister of that arrogant jackass Kiba, had helped them a lot since she was assigned. Over the last few weeks she had taught him and Hanada how to cook properly, make any household repairs, and was there to counsel them about anything that was bothering them. When they discovered that this kind young woman was Kiba's older sister, they were honestly shocked. The both of them could not figure out how someone like her could possibly have a sibling like Kiba and when they told her so, she couldn't say she was really surprised. She explained to them that Kiba, despite his claiming otherwise, was basically the runt of the clan despite being the child of the clan head. She told them that Kiba was always picking fights, and losing them with others in a poor attempt to prove how superior to them solely on the fact that he was the son of Inazuka Sume, one of the toughest and strongest ninja in the village. He was of the belief that having strong parents meant that you were automatically strong yourself. Which was just nonsense since having strong genes meant nothing if one doesn't put in the effort needed to actually reach their potential. And in truth, Kiba took more after their deceased father than their mother. It turns out that Hannah's parents were in an arranged marriage that was set up by the elders due to her grandparents' strength and reputation. Her grandparents on both sides were strong in Azuka and the elders believed that any children they had would likely be strong as well and that uniting the two families would create an even stronger union. Unfortunately, while her mother did indeed end up being a strong warrior, her father ended up being slightly below average when it came to strength and skill when compared to others. When the marriage contract came into effect, Sume was an elite Jonin and an impressive fighter while her father was only a mid-ranked Chunin with no special talents. What's worse, them being married caused his already slightly large ego to swell at the fact that he was married to the clan head. This caused him to start causing trouble. It started out small with him being a little bossy and started demanding respect. But it only got worse as time went on, even with Sume and other members of the clan constantly beating him back into line. It all finally came to head about three months after Kiba was born when her father tried to force himself onto another woman. UAL assault was a major offense in the clan, easily punishable by banishment. So when it was discovered what he had attempted to do, the rest of the clan was livid. It was even worse since the woman he assaulted was already married and pregnant, and that the assault caused the woman to have a miscarriage. The woman's husband, when he found out, was completely livid and called on clan laws for a fight to the death. Long story short, her father was torn apart and killed, with his remains buried in an unmarked grave in the Konoha Cemetery, which was a sign of dishonor to not be buried in the clan's graveyard with their ancestors. Naruto condoled Hannah about the death of her father and how he turned out, but also warned her that if Kiba ever even thought about forcing himself on somebody he cared about then when he finishes with him there won't even be a body left to bury. Hannah understood and assured the both of them that she and her mother would ensure that such a thing would never happen while they were still around. Anyway, Naruto had talked to Hannah about his growing feelings for Hanada and, after she got done teasing him, encouraged him that though he was planning to graduate this year it didn't mean he wouldn't be able to still spend time with Hanada. What's more, Hannah revealed that for the first few months to a year will be filled with D-rank and a few low C-rank missions and that D-ranks as a whole are basically glorified chores that most civilians are too lazy to do themselves. This revelation slightly irritated Naruto that the village was forcing those who are supposed to be trained warriors to be reduced to perform chores like painting fences, weeding gardens, and carrying groceries. 
Naruto was of the firm belief that such duties were better served by academy students and as a punishment detail for misbehaving shinobi. When he said as much to Hana, she agreed and explained that most of the shinobi forces were of similar minds but the civilian council with the backing of the village elders kept blocking any attempts to change for such reforms. Naruto grumbled for a few minutes about uppity civilians and dried up former shinobi needing to mind their own business and not stick their noses in the business of the shinobi. When he was finished grumbling he thanked Hana for her advice and the information before heading out to do some training and making plans for a date with Hanada. Hash hashtag three days later, noon, Naruto's apartment hash hash today was the day. Over the last three days he had prepared so everything would be perfect with his date with Hanada. Two days ago he had approached Hiyashi about dating his daughter and for any additional advice he may have. After Hiyashi scaring him half to death with his very descriptive threat of what he would do to him if he hurt his daughter, Hiyashi told him of a restaurant that was run by the Akamichi clan that Hanada was rather fond of, along with the information that she was rather partial to violet tulips. After thanking him for the info, he made his way to the Akamichi compound to talk to their clan head Choza about arranging a table for him and Hanada. This had also resulted in both his wife, Karara, and the visiting wives of the other two members of the Ino Shika Cho, those wives being Nara Yoshino and Inochi Kikio, to overhear them and, after several minutes of them gushing over how kawaii, cute, the whole thing was, began offering advice on how to act during their date and Kikio promising to get him some flowers the three of them dragged him out to secure some more formal clothes. Two hours later, after the three wives having made him constantly have him try on different outfits, Naruto was finally able to head home with everything squared away. He also swore that from then on he would do everything he possibly could to avoid having to shop with females again. That experience had honestly traumatized him a little with how Yoshino, Kikio, and Karara acted, as if he was nothing more than a dress-up doll for nothing more than their enjoyment. With a slight shudder at the memories, he shook his head and focused on his most important task, actually asking Hanada out. Entering the apartment, he saw Hanada on the couch studying a Juken scroll with another scroll lying next to her filled with notes. Quietly making his way to their shared room, he put away his new clothes before taking a deep breath and steeled his nerves. Walking back to the couch, he reached out and tapped Hanada's shoulder, causing her to jump slightly before looking up in surprise. Upon seeing him and his slightly nervous expression, she asked what was wrong. Gulping slightly, Naruto replied. Well Hina-chan. I was wondering, if you won't be busy, would you do me the honor and go on a D date with me? He said with a slight stutter at the end. Hanada gained a deer in the headlights expression as her face slowly grew redder. It was only a few minutes later when Naruto got a reaction. Hash hash Kumo. Rakage's office, two minutes earlier hash hash. Currently in the office of the Rakage located in Kumogakir no Sado, village hidden by clouds, in Kaminari no Kuni, land of lightning. The Rakage's office was rectangular in shape with rounded corners and had a desk, sofa, and various exercise weights strewn about the room. Currently sitting on a sofa that was in front of a wall composed solely of floor to ceiling windows looking out over the mountainous range that made up Kumo was a large, muscular, dark skinned man with pale blonde hair pulled back into several rows of dreadlocks along with a small mustache and pointed goatee, pronounced cheekbones with tear troughs under his eyes, and a prominent crease across his forehead. The man wore a white howry over his torso and had on large, golden vambraces on his wrist, a golden belt with a boar's face engraved on it black pants with torn ends, kumo nin shin guards, and shinobi sandals. This man was a, the yandaimi rakage of kumo, currently the fastest man alive and the son of the former sandame rakage, a. Currently, a was rubbing his temples to stove off a headache that was forming due to the sole other occupant of his office as he took a break from the seemingly endless paperwork. The other man has dark skin and a muscular build with white hair and a goatee. He possessed two tattoos, on his right shoulder was a tattoo of the kanji for iron and on his left cheek was a tattoo of a bull's horns. His top lip was slightly darker than his bottom one and his eyes were hidden by oval-shaped sunglasses, above which was a white hite ate with the Kumo village symbol of two clouds, one overlapping the other, on the metal plate. He wore his village's standard one strap over the shoulder flak jacket over his bare torso, with standard Kumo hand and shin guards, shinobi sandals, a white scarf around his neck that produced a single tail down his back that had a tattered end, and a long, red rope belt tied around his waist with the two ends hanging down to his ankles. On his back were seven Kumo Cho Biberato Raitanto, 
super vibrato lightning release swords, with four handles going over his right and left shoulders, two handles per shoulder, and the final three sword handles coming out at a downward diagonal angle from his right side. This man was Kira Bai, Killer B, A's adoptive brother and Jinchuriki of the Hachibi no Kyogyu, Eight Tails Giant Ox. Said brother was currently pestering, and irritating, his brother about taking a vacation from the village. While for any other leader, it would be perfectly reasonable to allow their subordinate to take a vacation. However for A, such was not a possibility. When it came to his brother Bai, not only was he a Jinchuriki, but it was almost guaranteed that letting him out of the village would inevitably cause trouble due to either Bai picking a fight with somebody, or he would irritate people due to his incessant need to constantly speak like he was rapping. And that was another reason for A's headache. Bai, despite thinking otherwise, was a horrible rapper due to both his off-key tempo and horrible rhyming skills. As A was about to blow his top and subject his brother to his iron kuro technique, iron claw, to shut him up, he was interrupted by Squee a high-pitched squeal echoed throughout Kumogakure and vibrated the windows of the Reikage's office. The sudden noise startled enough that when he jumped in surprise from his place on the couch and fell on the floor, grumbling to himself, it quickly got up with a scowl on his face as he looked around while asking what in Kami-sama's name that noise was. This of course set off his brother on another rap tangent that made his mood worsen. Not being able to take it any longer, I grabbed Bai by the face as he yelled to shut up before launching him out of the office through one of the windows. Hash hashtag back in Konoha. Naruto's apartment hash hash Naruto slowly uncovered his ears after Hanada stopped squealing. Looking around the room, he observed that most of the glass around them was either cracked or broken from the high-pitched sound waves produced from Hanada. Turning his attention to the couch where Hanada was, Naruto looked at her unconscious form with amusement. With a small smile, Naruto murmured to himself, well, I suppose I'll take that as a yes, as he went and sat down next to her. It took half an hour before Hanada regained consciousness. During that time several people came to stop by to ask what happened and what caused such a loud noise, including the Sandame and Orochimaru. Needless to say, they were all amused to find out that the loud squealing was Hanada's reaction to him asking her out on a date. Hanada steered from her spot on the couch. Slowly sitting up with her eyes half-lidded and a dreamy smile on her face, Naruto couldn't help from asking. So, did you have a nice dream? He said with an undertone of amusement. Hanada responded with a nod, at first not realizing who was talking to her as she responded. Hi. I had such a wonderful it. Naruto-kun asked me out on a date but before I could agree I passed out. Sigh too bad it was only a dream. I would have loved to go out with Naruto-kun. Hanada trailed off as she woke up more and realized exactly who she was talking to. Her face turning a shade of red that would put tomatoes to shame as she asterisk eeped asterisk and seemed to shrink in on herself at the sight of Naruto's amused face. Feeling more embarrassed than she had in her entire life, Hanada was drawn from her embarrassment when Naruto started speaking. Well Hina-chan, first off I can assure you that it wasn't a dream and I did indeed ask you out on a date. And secondly, though I was already sure of your answer due to your response, I'm still glad that you physically said yes. Here Hanada's face somehow managed to turn even redder. Now then, I've secured dinner reservations at the Golden Leaf today at 7, so we have a little over two hours to get ready okay. Hanada nodded, somewhat surprised that their date would take place at her favorite restaurant. Smiling, Naruto got up from the couch and went to his room to get his clothes for their date. Changing clothes, Naruto left his room and headed to the front door where he turned to the still stunned Hanada on the couch and gave her a smile before speaking. Well, I'll be gone for the next hour to take care of some last minute things for our date, okay? When I get back, I'll expect you to be ready. It's a 45 minute walk to the restaurant so we'll have an extra 15 minutes to ourselves before we need to go. Naruto said, causing Hanada to blink owlishly as she slowly processed what he said before her eyes widened and she bolted for the bedroom. Not even a minute later the sounds of drawers being frantically slammed open and clothes hitting the ground could be heard. Not being able to contain his snickers at Hanada's antics, Naruto turned and exited the front door before beginning to make his way to Yamanaka flower shop. It would take him around 20 minutes to get there, with another 3 to 5 minutes to get some of Hanada's favorite flowers for her, and finally another 20 minutes to get back. Whistling a quiet tune to himself, he continued on his way, thinking about his date and hoping that everything went perfectly. The end. Now we will see you in the next video.